Good evening. The board now reconvenes this meeting of the Plano ISD Board of Trustees in open session at 7.15 p.m. on January 24th, 2017 at the Plano ISD Administration Building. I'm Missy Bender, President of the Plano ISD Board of Trustees. On the board's behalf, I wish to extend a warm welcome to all who are present and to our web and video viewers. This is lovely. I can't see you all. <laughs> <laughs> It's like at a dinner and there's a, a candelabra in the middle, you know. Um, we will conduct our meeting focusing on the district's two major goals, con ensuring the continued improvement in student learning and ensuring the efficient use of resources. Let me introduce my fellow trustees and staff. Seated to my left are Dr. Brian Bingley, our superintendent of schools, Nancy Humphrey, board vice president, trustees Tammy Richards and David Stolley, Susan Modisette, our Assistant Superintendent for Campus Services, Dr. Matthew Gutierrez, Assistant Superintendent for Employee Services, and Dr. Jim Wusso, Assistant Superintendent for Academic Services. Seated to my right are Carolyn Mobius, our Board Secretary, Dr. Yoram Solomon, Dr. Carrie Cooper, our Assistant Superintendent for District Services, Steve Fortenberry, Chief Financial Officer, Dan Armstrong, Assistant Superintendent for Technology Services, Carla Oliver, Assistant Superintendent for Government, Community and Planning Initiatives, and Denise Gillespie, Executive Assistant to the Superintendent and Board of Trustees. I would also now like to thank the members of our Food and Nutritional Services Department for serving as our greeters and for distributing the agendas and comment cards. Please join us in applauding these staff members for their assistance this evening. <laughs> I wish they brought wacky cake. <laughs> Can't do that anymore. I know. <laughs> but maybe. <laughs> coming back. Um, before we have our inspirational message and Pledge of Allegiance, I'd like to share some news with our, our uh, community at large. Um, Betty Hahn, who is the uh, namesake of Han Elementary School passed away yesterday after an extended illness. The family has requested no flowers, but rather in, uh, any donations may be made to the Plano Education Foundation and designated for Han Elementary Campus. Miss Betty Han was employed as the first secretary in Plano Public Schools in 1957 by Superintendent of Schools E.A. Sigler. We just want to share that news with our community and, and our thoughts are with her family. Um, we will now turn to our Vice President Nancy Humphrey who will share an inspirational message with us this evening. Thank you, Ms. Bender. I'm always amazed, and pardon my voice, I had a speaking engagement yesterday and it uh, has evaded me, but I'm always amazed when I walk in the doors of our schools and I see great learning taking place. I know that our teachers and our principals are planting the seed of a tree they may never get to see. As we carry out our meeting tonight, I'd like to share some quotes that may help keep our vision where it should be focused. <clears throat> Excuse me again. The best teachers are the ones who tell you where to look, but they don't tell you what to, what to see. And that's Alexandra Trenfor. It is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. And that is from Albert Einstein. The beautiful thing about learning is that no one can take it away from you. And that's from B.B. King. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And that is from Nelson Mandela. Tell me and I'll forget. Show me and I may remember. Involve me and I learn. And I think that's an old Chinese pro proverb, but I believe Benjamin Franklin was quoted using that. And then the only thing more expensive than education is ignorance. And that again is Benjamin Franklin. And finally, because we just celebrated the, um, uh, the birthday of MLK Jr., intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you. And so will you please stand and join me and face the flag over here. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please stand. 
We will now recognize special guests who are with us this evening. Ms. Oliver, do we have any special student guests who we would like to recognize? In fact, we do. Um, representing the Rice Middle School area, we have troop number 380, if you would stand for recognition. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ms. Oliver. Um, I will now stick with Ms. Oliver, and uh, she will introduce uh, the recognition of two Plano East Senior High School grand prize winning students. Yes, thank you. It's an honor to share this information with our community and at large. Um, in December, two outstanding scientists from Plano East Senior High captured the grand prize at the National Siemens Competition in Math, Science, and Technology. And I apologize for reading, but I want to be sure and get it exactly right. Um, after watching an uncle struggle with mental illness and several misdiagnoses before being diagnosed with schizophrenia, they were motivated to develop a new approach to diagnose schizophrenia earlier in patients with higher certainty using both brain scans and psychiatric evaluations. From a group of 498 semifinalists in October of 2016, the Siemens Science Competition narrowed the field over several competitions until on December the 6th, Adia and Shreya Besum captured the $100,000 grand prize in the team category. This evening, the board would like to invite these students to the podium where the board would like to honor them with certificates of recognition presented tonight by board vice president Nancy Humphrey and um, President Bender, if you would join them also because we would like to have a quick photo op with you as well. It's our distinct honor to give you these certificates. Um, I don't know, tell me your names, which um, Shreya. Shreya, okay, yeah. I didn't know which one. Shreya, here is your certificate. We are so proud of you and the work that you've done. And we're so, so excited for your future. Thank you so much. And you want a photo? Uh, shall we, where would you like to sneak over here? Congratulations are being offered to these students. If you're here in support of them, I see principal and I see science coordinator and parents. If, if you happen to be here, please stand. Any members of their family, please stand so that we can recognize you as well. Ms. Oliver, uh -huh. um, I think both ladies have some commentary. Absolutely. We, Please okay. step to the podium and share those with us. We'd love to have oh. your comments. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. So first of all, Shreya and I wanted to thank you all for inviting us here and allowing us uh, the opportunity to be recognized at this level. It's really great to see a lot of familiar faces here. And um, throughout our journey in creating our project and our path to the Siemens finals, we've been extremely fortunate to have a support group of teachers and administrators, many of whom are present today. And we just wanted to take some time to thank the specific people who brought us to this point. Um, we couldn't have done it without our great science fair team. Um, Ms. Baker and uh, Ms. Shepard are some of the main pillars of our local science fair community. And they offered encouragement and motivation during the always arduous scientific process. And uh, while working on Siemens and during our time away at Nationals, we were fortunate that the wonderful Mr. King and Ms. Witcher supported us and rallied support at our home base of Plano East, and we're extremely grateful for all that support. And finally, we'd like to thank the many teachers and administrators present here, as people like you inspire students to learn with passion and strive for bigger and better things. Uh, we appreciate you all from the bottom of our heart. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies, can you tell us what your future holds? 
<laughs> yeah, go sure. there. Because then you'll then then Next everybody gets fun. to enjoy it. Yeah, we're not going to leave you alone. <laughs> um, so we're definitely looking towards um, presenting our project in places in the future and publishing it in a few scientific papers. And um, this is definitely a category um, that we want to look into in the future. Bioinformatics and mental illnesses are something that we're never going to stop um, striving to help. Yeah, and we hope uh, what we did with our project was we were trying to sort of raise awareness for mental illnesses and uh, sort of decrease the social stigma that a lot of people have for that. So we'll never, we'll, we'll, um, we hopefully want to continue trying to do that in the future and beyond college. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Board members, do you have any? Are you comments? seniors? I can't remember. Um, no, we're, we're juniors. juniors. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. okay. We, we tend to talk in unison. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Congrat <laughs> Congratulations to mom and dad and family and friends. Yeah. Boy, you must be proud. We're very proud of you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. You are. Yes, and the whole organization, we're intensely proud of you. We, you know, when I got to read the comments from the folks at Siemens, you know, that it, it's incredible that they're like, wow, people in this profession are saying, I think they've got it. I think they've got something here. And, and they were astounded at the level of work um, and also the tenacity and the passion for it. And, and so, I just applaud you for that. Thank and, you so and, much. Yes. And, and as a point of personal privilege, while it's Plano East Day, um, <laughs> since Mr. King's sitting there, Ms. Shepard, I, I, I gave you advance notice. We just learned today we will be recognizing another Plano East student in the next board meeting. So would you mind if you could just use your teacher voice, yell out to folks what we learned today, and then we'll, <laughs> while Mr. King is sitting there proud. Very fine. proud of the work that gets done within our science research effort and so many teachers and thank you for uh, acknowledging the work of of teachers who who kind of maybe lit that passion a little bit more and, and, and helped you along the way thank you very much and we're very proud of you we're proud to recognize our students and teachers who are uh, achieving at the state national and global levels so we're glad to welcome and recognize your achievement here uh, Ms. Oliver, I think we have an additional recognition because it is January. It and is January. Because it's January, it's School Board Recognition Month. It is. It is. And I'm also so pleased to share that recognition with you. And I will say when we're done with this piece, I do have another guest to recognize. Okay. So if I can slip that in there. But first, let's get on to the recognition of our school board. Um, and that's not the right one. Here I am. Um, so across the state of Texas, to your point, January is considered School Board Recognition Month. And although we are thankful to our board for their service throughout the year, Plano ISD welcomes this very formal opportunity to say thank you. Your dedication and willingness to serve as advocates for our children in public schools is so strongly appreciated. At this time, I invite you to take a look at the gifts that I think are now beside your chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and just take a peek in those bags and I'll share with you what's in there. You've been provided with travel mugs made by students at Brinker and McCall Elementary Schools, Rice Middle School, and Clark High School. <laughs> Leading this effort was Laura Grundler, District Visual Arts Coordinator, who worked with the campus art specialist and students. 
These mugs are meant to be a reminder of the important work you do for our community of learners and a reminder of our gratitude for your service. And also included in your bag are truffles beautifully prepared by the talented students in the culinary arts program at Plano East, working under the direction of teacher Lois Conlon. Love it. Beautiful. So although this recognition is brief, it was certainly worth mentioning, and we hope that you enjoyed these tokens of appreciation today, honoring the important work that you do all year long as advocates for public education. We sincerely thank you for your service, and I invite the audience to please give our board a round of applause. And Ms. Bender, if I could, on behalf of our cabinet and our entire organization, we, we appreciate the, the leadership and, and, and work and, and support that our board gives. You know, if you come to our meetings or even whether they're public or private, not everybody agrees with everything all the time, but I think there is nobody that would question that everybody here on this board um, is here because they want what is best for 55,000 children in our community and in our organization. So on behalf of that organization, I, I want to say thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. I will also add that Brittany Usry had a lot to do with that as well. So between she and Laura Grendler, I think there's quite nothing they could do, they could not do. So again, real quick on personal on guests that are with us tonight, I believe we have one member of the current Plano Youth Leadership class, as well as three members of the board from Youth Leadership. Are you here tonight? Could you stand for recognition? <laughs> Lorraine. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Miss Oliver. Thank you for yes. uh, all of the the artistic talent that went into these uh, things we can enjoy now and later. Yes, our kids are really something. Thank you. Uh, we will now move to the regular public comment portion of our agenda. For the public comment portion, our board has public comment cards that were accepted from 6 to 7 p.m. Cards are not accepted after 7 p.m. and are not transferable to other parties or speakers. All cards will be collected and given to Ms. Oliver or a representative of the Communications Department who will present the speakers at this time. Ms. Oliver, do we have any speakers for public comment now? We do. We have six speakers for agenda topics. Okay. So pursuant to board policies, BED legal, BED local, and BED exhibit, the board may place reasonable restraints on the number, length, and frequency of presentations so long as it does not unfairly discriminate among speakers based upon their viewpoint. There's a lot that I have to read here, so just bear with me. <laughs> the board is not authorized to discuss or act on the public's comments or complaints if the subject is not on the agenda. If a member of the public or the board inquires about a subject for which notice has not been given, the board may only make a statement of specific factual information, recite existing policy in response to the inquiry, or refer the person to a staff member for more information or assistance. If the subject of the public comment is already on the agenda for the meeting, the board may invite the speaker to stay until the board reaches that topic on the agenda. 30 minutes have been allotted to hear persons who desire to make comments to the board. Persons who wish to participate in this portion shall complete the appropriate public comment form before the meeting begins and indicate the topic about which they wish to speak. No presentation shall exceed three minutes. If you are not finished speaking by the end of your three minutes, I will interrupt you so that we can move to the next person. Carolyn Mobius, our secretary, will help. She will keep time and she will motion to you. If you don't look at me, I'll say one. So that tells you one minute. Okay, so delegations of more than five persons shall appoint one person to present their views to the board. Finally, pursuant to Texas Government Code sections 551.074 and 551.0821, the board will not permit the presentation of personally identifiable information regarding a student and will not discuss the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or to hear a complaint or charge against an employee or officer pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.074. Should a speaker wish to address one of these issues, they must do, th do so through the appropriate local grievance policies, FNG Local, DGBA Local, or GF Local. Ms. Oliver, <laughs> with all of that having concluded, would you like to call speakers to the podium? 
Yes, um, and just to help, we'll call the first couple of speakers so you can line up and know which order you're coming in since we have six. So I'll call three names. First, beginning with, Sa I'm sorry, Shazia Al-Hassan, followed by Andy Mahmood. And the last speaker in that series will be Obaid Siddiqui. Oh, yes, to the center podium, thank you, and please use the microphone and state your name. Hello, my name is Shazia Hassan, and I'm a college mom of a uh, ISD student. Uh, she goes to Macmillan. I just have one question. Uh, could you tell me the number of Muslim students in PISD? During this section, this is not uh, back and forth. Okay. This is you making comments to okay. us, oh, okay? I'm sorry. I That's okay. I'll just explain how it works. Mm -hmm. So if you, have, if you have questions about something that's coming up later on the agenda, um, we ask you to stay uh, you know, and listen to that. So if you want to ask us questions, we can't necessarily go back and forth with you, but we'll try to address them when we get to that item on the agenda. Okay. So would you do me a favor and tell me again what you uh, wanted to I'm know? I wanted to know the number of Muslim students uh, in PISD because we have two celebrations during the year, Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fadr. One is after Ramadan, and one is the yearly pilgrimage. And I know that you all uh, give, uh, have approved excused absences for those three days, but our concern is that even uh, the children get excused absence, but the calendar in the school, uh, the teachers still have major testing during those days or some assignments and stuff like that. So how can we get some help in that? in this regard. Okay, so we will be talking about that on the agenda item. Thank you. Next, Mr. Mahmoud. Good evening. First of all, I want to say that I'm in no shape or form prepared for this. <laughs> so okay. Five minutes ago. Just hold it a little but, closer to your mouth. Um, Thank you. Essentially, what we feel that it's in line of the and religious diversity is one of the many values of the great country that we live in. And um, approximately 70 to 80 mosques is residing in this area. And out of that, I would say about 70,000 Muslims are currently residing in the North Texas region. We have a huge abundance of student body that's currently going to be uh, public school. And our request to you is to respect our two most sacred holidays that we have, which is Eid al-Adha and Eid al um, we actually recently moved from New York. We have a similar situation over there, and they already passed a law. I is recognizing the Muslim holidays over there. And we would like something like that nature, just like as we celebrate Christmas or any major holidays. Um, even for the uh, Eid falls in such a time frame, we are having important exams going on, and students cannot miss the classes. But it's actually mandatory for us to respect the holiday and be off of any type of work during that, during that time. So I would like the board to consider this, um, this ma major holiday for us because and I don't have the actual demographic information in terms of what percentage of students are Muslim currently going to plan a school district. I know my daughter will be going pretty soon. I have two other daughters. I recently moved in East Plano. And there are plenty of us that's currently moving, you know, almost like three or four families every week. I would like you to consider this very seriously because otherwise they'll be unnecessarily going, having to go, go through absence in school, which we don't want to see. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Obaid Siddiqui. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I actually also found out from agenda that the religious observation calendar is being discussed. So I don't know much what you will be discussing, so I want, I'm want i here to listen to it and contribute as much as I can. And again, as uh, I just mentioned, that there is a lot of influx of people from different uh, cities here, and a lot of uh, people of Islamic faith also are moving here, and and there's a need for them, and there's a stress on the families on the, on the holidays, uh, how to handle this, how to handle the homework and all that. So. We definitely would like to have those uh, holidays recognized and uh, added to the calendar. And also, I have, for your information, 2017 and 2018 
uh, holidays, two of the most important holidays marked on this. So if you need it, I can provide that also. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, will first be Amy Ratliff, followed by Mahmouda Hossein and Shaheen Salam following to, to finish up. Thank you. Good evening, you guys. Um, I first wanted to say that I'm really excited that Plano ISD is going to be part of the District of Innovation and that we had the opportunity to change the start and end date of our calendar. So very excited about that. Um, I wanted to just give my preference. I know that it's not something that we're voting on right now, but just I wanted to let you guys know what I think. Um, I personally like the midweek start because I believe that it gives the best split between the first and second semester with four equal days than we have currently. Um, there was one thing that I wanted to point out, and hopefully you guys can, when we get to that point, can just discuss and clarify it because I know this is a concern to lots of families that I've talked to. It's not a big deal, but I just, it was something that I noticed um, that on the mid start and the early start, there's one less day during the Christmas break. So I was wondering why that is going to change when the traditional, if we kept the traditional start and end date, why that has an extra day. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next, we're looking for Mahmouda Hussein. I'm Mahmouda Hussein, and my um, children go to, uh, my daughter goes to Plano uh, Junior High. My three, uh, my two other son graduated from there already. So um, I know that it's struggle when there's a holiday come up, like our uh, two major holidays. So um, I know there's struggle, I know our uh, my struggle. So. I um, requested you that you know if you can just consider that in you know, the I mean our holiday you put it in this calendar that would be great help for us or for our Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker is Shaheen Salam. Good evening. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, just keep it real close. Can we hear pieces here? Yeah. First of all, I would like to thank you all for your service to Plano ISD students and to the community at large. This is a great service, and I'm really proud of my board, the ISD board. Uh, this quest, I have a comment about, again, like many others, I'm going to comment about the religious, religious holidays um, that PISD is going to recognize, hopefully. I don't know. I have not read the, that section yet, and it's, I think, number nine on, on the agenda. Uh, when I moved to Plano in 97, my kids were already out of school. They were in college, so none of my kids went to PISD schools. But I was always very involved in PISD. I was a board member of the Plano ISD Education Foundation, a Diversity Advocacy Committee, and so on. Um, now, I have custody of four grandkids who came to Plano in 2014, and they are all in PISD now, starting from elementary right up to senior high. So I feel compelled now to get more involved, uh, not as part of the board, but as just a parent into what all goes on in schools. Uh, my comment is that uh, I don't know what the religious holiday entails in the agenda. I just want to pass one comment. Last year, my eldest grandson, uh, who was in Jasper at that time, uh, had to take summer school uh, to get one credit out of the way. During summer school, Eid holiday fell. Our religious festival was on July 6th. And uh, I wrote a note to school, summer school teacher, that he would be one minute, keep on talking. Oh, sorry, uh, that he will be um, not attending school. However, when I got the report, his, his absence was marked unexcused. So that's a comment I want to make, that when you 
consider the holidays, please bear that in mind, because Eid holidays always move. They're never on the same day. So if it happens to be in summer school again, it should be an excuse absence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming to speak, and I, I'm, I'm optimistic that your questions will get addressed when we get to that agenda item. Uh, we will now address the consent agenda, which includes personnel recommendations, minutes of previous meetings, bids, <coughs> purchases, and construction items. Are there any requests to remove an item or items from the consent agenda for further discussion? Not for me. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Timing is separate. <laughs> uh, with the approval of the consent agenda, the board will now continue with agenda items for discussion and action. Um, Susan Modisat, our assistant superintendent for campus services, We'll begin the discussion of the possible action regarding the settlement agreement and release related to the identified special education student. Ms. Modisette. Thank you. I would recommend that we uh, approve the settlement agreement. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Um, our next item is uh, from Dr. Matthew Gutierrez, our Assistant Superintendent for Employee Services. Um, Dr. Gutierrez, can you address the next item, please? Yes, President Binder, I'd like to request that this item be removed um, from the agenda due to the employee tendering their resignation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gutierrez, board members. Uh, you'll recall you were informed about this uh, change in circumstance. So um, following our agreed upon protocol, we've all been notified and I will now pull this item from the agenda as requested by administration. Uh, next item on our agenda has to do with our legislative priorities for the 85th legislative session, which is now underway. Uh, board members, you will find at your place a, uh, a revised, ever so slightly revised list of legislative priorities. The only thing that we removed is the item in red under uh, funding related priorities. Nancy, would you like to speak to that at all? Because I know you were more involved in um, well, certainly <coughs> this process. That that was one of the items that we were um, looking at was to find a way to support our teachers in their TRS active care and I believe at one point we were seeking the flexibility for them to opt out of the TRS active care but we have found that that is really detrimental to the process and I believe that as this <coughs> excuse me no voice <laughs> the legislative session moves on we're going to seek more guidance in this our we can come back to the board and add to our priorities it's kind of a dynamic process as you can imagine because um how many bills have been already filed mr fortenberry over 1400 or something uh, i know it's over a thousand yeah yeah lots of bills have been filed and so um we have reached out to um tim lee with the Teacher, retired Teachers Association in Texas and we have yet to have a chance to have a conversation with him to seek his guidance in this area so at this point we're move, we're pulling it from the legislative priorities but we're not pulling it from our consideration to go forward but um, we definitely want to support our teachers okay. so uh, with that in mind uh, board members do I have a motion to approve as presented uh, let me just ask, what is it that you're asking to approve? Are just you asking removal. to approve just the removal? Just the removal. Okay. Yes, and we may come back to say, once we know more, is you know more specifically, how can we be supportive of teachers? Then we may come back. But right now, we don't want to. Uh, we don't have enough information to answer that question. We've reached out. We haven't gotten the answer. So we're just going to pull that. Okay. So do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please raise your hand. 
Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And look, now we're at reports, item nine. <laughs> we can move fast. Yeah. Okay, so at this time, Carla Oliver, our Assistant Superintendent for Government, Community, and Planning Initiatives will provide an update on the topic of religious observances as requested by the board. However, first I will turn it over to Dr. Bingley to introduce the topic. Thank, thank you, President Bender. Just as a kind of a bringing everybody in the room up to date as to how we uh, arrived at this recommendation, uh, and as a reminder, of course, to our board, um, Plano ISD for years has always provided our schools with uh, a, a very comprehensive list of, of the observances and the religious holidays for a multitude of the faiths that, that our children uh, are practice. And included in that is a, a, a description of the significance of that particular observance for that faith so that uh, it was not only what are the days, but what do they mean? And, and we've done really for many years a pretty good job of, of explaining to our, all of our uh, school uh, teams th those, those observances. Um, what really came to the question in November was, well, maybe we do the job too well in that we identify virtually every uh, observance in in all of these faiths and so if you're a school team you're confronted with the reality that if you wanted to say uh, not have by choice major school uh, events or major assessments so that would be really difficult given this list of 50 uh, some uh, significant uh, religious observances so our board uh, charged us with saying wait a minute are there some within these faiths that, that rise to just such a significant level of, of meaning that we ought to try to identify those and see how few ultimately they might be? Uh, and armed with that information, does that give us the idea then or the opportunity to share with our schools a, a different message about uh, potential uh, avoidance of things and so the first task that we took um, very seriously obviously this was a November was a long time ago um, but I want to kind of give Carla Ms. Oliver credit uh, for really taking a pretty significant dive into this and I'm gonna let her kind of walk through first the learning opportunity and then then I'll revisit the recommendation that we're making for our board and for our community this evening Thank you, Dr. Bingley, I appreciate the compliment. That's to be shared with um, lots of folks in our department as well, so I, I thank you for that. So I'll just briefly go over some points that I think will maybe remind us of where we were and now where we are for this discussion. So I'd say, with and try not to repeat Dr. Bingley, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Um, with a direction from the Board of Trustees, um, I would say I personally conducted research among the faith community regarding religious observances and or acknowledgements that might be made. Um, I'd like to describe to you um, in using the district's resource of religious and holy days calendar, which we published, which is an internal tool for principals and program managers to use as a guide um, in planning for their school, which that tool is built from using information from the interfaith calendar as one source and then another the resource for planning the school calendar as published by the National School PR Association so my colleagues across the state and nation realize that this is something that needs our attention additionally the Plano ISD diversity advocacy committee and I'll mention Autry Daniel with that as well um, offer uh, and, the, and various community members connected to that offer input and feedback in compiling this calendar tool that our principals use um, and then it's also sent to our district's legal counsel. So that's just information about how we get to the tool that we currently use. Um, but as the board requested, I spoke to various faith leaders and members of the Diversity Advocacy Committee to tell us about the religious observances that are held most sacred uh, among the multiple days listed in the calendar tool. So we have a lot of observances on those, on those sheets, I think as someone pointed out at the podium, but we did ask very sincerely for what would be the most sacred that would rise within that faith that might need uh, consideration. So considering the solicited feedback, 
uh, I would say five observances, some of which are multiple days, uh, have been discussed to bring more awareness and the expectations for respectful scheduling within the school day and some evenings. Provided in your report that you all received as trustees are sample emails and discussions um, presented that are simply exhibits to the research we're discussing now. So to that end, a recommendation is being made by our cabinet team tonight and with your review of the research findings and the included recommendation in your board packet, I'll ask, shall I present the recommendation or would you like for more discussion? What's the pleasure of the board? I have a clarifying question about the, um, the third Jewish holiday in terms of Passover. So that is actually a duration of one week for that holiday? It is. But again, this is presenting research to you uh, we have the opportunity to go back and, and, and look at those. That was something specifically shared with me as, as one of those most sacred to, get, to garner that kind of attention. But we can certainly look at what we feel would be the most um, appropriate acknowledgement on our calendars. And I can go over some of that with you in the recommendation when you are ready. To, to touch on that though, I, I believe that the, the input was that it's, it's really the night before and the first day off. So again, um, this sort of ties to our next item as well. And so that's where we might move some things as far as designations or acknowledgements on our calendar. But that's just simply the research being shared. So again, we're not, this is presented for, for, as a report to you. And then we also have a report following that where we may be able to tie those two together. Yeah, I, I, I was struck by the same issue Tammy right. was, which is that that's a, a full week right. of, of what we're suggesting no testing or, or no events and uh, just very small sample anecdotally that I called a couple of friends and who said it's the first couple of nights right. are the, the key nights of, of Passover right yeah so just to recap Carla I, I know you talked to various school districts in the area like I we did. asked you to do you found out what our existing practice is and sometimes it, it worked well and sometimes it didn't work well. We heard some examples from speakers here where it didn't always work well. Right. And um, so, and then I know you've talked to the diversity committee, you've talked to faith leaders because you've communicated, you've sent an inquiry out to them to request what are your most holy days. Yes. And you've received responses from them. Yes, from the ones that have been mentioned. And I will say, just in, in starting this whole our research base, there were some obvious areas to go. But I also went back and pulled, um, not accounting for those that may have been received today or in the last couple of days regarding calendar, um, but for any emails that the district may have received in reference to asking questions for clarification of why was this handled this way, why was one, my one child was, was um, dealt with this way and another child had to do a little more or a little less. Um, so just inconsistencies or something that we might want to find. So there were about, there were approximately 50, that's what these are, and I flagged some things that will be for cabinet discussion at a later time. But I did want you to know that I went back and refreshed my memory of the emails that we had received. So of the various faith communities, um, to my knowledge, we do not have data around the numbers of students that belong to different faith communities. No. Um, and with that question being asked, and, and frankly, I saw that written on one of the cards, um, just collectively here, now I'm not the expert on what we do and don't record, but I don't think we record students by faith. And so I'm not sure that we would have a quality yeah. answer to fulfill right. that request. We can have some anecdotal feelings, but that's not a piece of information that we would, would know. Are we even permitted to ask that question? I don't. I, I mean, we can't, we, we can't ask it just, I would citizenship. Say that would be among a, a general feeling of a principal or a staff knowing their campus community yeah. of parents and students, but yeah. not a report that we could generate. Um, I will mention, too, uh, Dr. Bailey mentioned the number of days on our interfaith calendar that we publish for principals as a tool. Um, there are a total of 24 holy days. Now, the calendar listing, and, and I can show this to the public as well, um, this is a calendar packet that goes out to our principals and it's an inside tool currently, but it has seven faiths that's represented uh, that we think largely in our community and with the directions to principals. However, I will say among all of those different observances, approximately 24 of those rise to the level among those faiths that are considered high holy days or of the most sacred. And some of those are multiple days, just like we mentioned the one with Passover. 
Um, so that's one thing I just mentioned I, I thought you might want to know since that's available by uh, request now, but it's really an internal tool, but that'll be a part of our recommendation as well. So, go ahead. Uh, if I, uh, and I know that I'm, I'm jumping into the calendars that you have in the next, uh, for the next agenda item, uh, without discussing anything further on those uh, calendars, what I have noticed is that there are six diamonds that are marked on specific days that are considered the high holidays, uh, and those cover several religions mm -hmm. and as based on the input that you have received um, I, I would say that that as we started the problem that we had was that we had as some of the speakers tonight mentioned the problem that we had was that uh, we had put kids of different faiths in a kind of an impossible position of you either acknowledge your faith and observe uh, the uh, holiday or you go to school because otherwise you're going to miss something and the problem, we, we always had our heart at the right place, and that is we wanted to observe. However, as you mentioned, the list, the entire list actually had 109 days, 53 of them were mentioned as, uh, were highlighted as high holidays. In, in my talking to a principal, to principals, I should say, uh, the feedback was, what do you want us to do? Uh, we can't take out 109 days. I believe that now that the instructions are so much more clear so much more focused on here are the high holidays and, and we have received quite a few emails uh, as we brought this up to the board uh, as we received that as a board uh, in October that now first of all the fact that we now have them on a calendar that is in the public domain I think is great progress already mm -hmm. because those are not things that are in an internal mm -hmm. document I think the second part is that uh, the, the fact that you reached out to all faiths here, uh, I think, is, is really important. Uh, this this uh, recommendation, as I see it now, does provide a lot of uh, clarity. And, and as a principal, I, kn I know that our principals were in the impossible position of what do you want us to do with 109 days. Now they look at six days that I need to avoid special activities and, uh, and um, uh, tests. Uh, major evaluations, that makes it a lot clearer. Uh, one of the things that I think we talked about right before that meeting, and, and you mentioned to me, Carla, is that your door stays open to if somebody has any further input, you will consider that. With that, I think that if the problem that we had was that we were putting kids in, in a few very specific dates, and, and our speakers today talked about two Muslim holidays uh, and uh, speaking with the Jewish community, uh, not that not that I'm a spokesperson, but we were talking about three days. Those six days that you have here, that would solve that problem. I'm happy to, to share for the audience's benefit because they've not had the right. Please identify those study. days, yes. and then I'll. And can we um, also go through the recommendations? We haven't done that part right. yet. Yes, yes. That, yeah, that would be good. Let me first context. share the, the name of the holidays, um, the dates for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur and Passover were identified for special awareness as sacred, sacred designation for the Jewish faith. And the dates of Eid al-Hadha and Eid al-Fatir. Eid um, al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr. Thank you. <laughs> Depending on which accent you prefer. <laughs> we all mean the same thing. Um, but those, um, those two holidays, I'm sorry, not holidays, but I would say holy days, were identified for special awareness regarding the most holy of, of observances among the Muslim, the Muslim faith. Um, so, Carla, I, if I could, I'll, yes. I'll take it from there because with that information and with that um, identification, we then did, in fact, go out to all of our principals and, and explain to them, uh, and it wasn't a week. Um, it, it was, in fact, the one day and night before. Um, and and asked for them to go back to their school site, connect with people on their campus, give us feedback as it related to, we, we knew that we were going to want to respect all and, and make a good decision, and, and we knew that we were going to have a recommendation that we avoid these days for major school activities. The question then became, do we want to just kind of overtly say that as a district and, and put that not only identify we knew we were going to identify them on our calendar or do we still want uh, schools to be able to just work independently with the community with their stakeholders 
And our principal said really exactly what we've talked about here. If, if we are down to these number of days, then all of us would prefer that we just make a uniform decision as a district. That way, families who have school uh, children in differing schools aren't likely to hear different messages. Um, so the recommendation that we are bringing to the board, uh, you, you'll notice, and yes, Carla, we had them up, yes, there they are. There they are. Uh, I mean, the first one, we were very intentional. We want to make sure the first thing is, this is about respecting all. That's the fundamental uh, mission here. Um, and we, we knew that we, we wanted to add a symbol as Dr. Solomon let the cat out of the bag. In our next discussion, no matter which calendar we choose, those symbols will be there uh, to denote those observances. And, and really the crux of our recommendation is in the third one, and that is we, we are going to uh, also revisit with our school campuses all this conversation we just had and why these rise to the level of significance for our children and, and understanding that we are going to have all of our schools avoid uh, major campus activities that they choose to put on dates um, and as we noted major assessments. Uh, now as a part of that we still feel like we need to allow our school campuses the opportunity to work with their uh, parent base. I, I, we didn't want to determine from 15th Street what a major campus activity is. Something might be very major on one campus that is, doesn't, hasn't been seen in the same light on another. Um, so we, we did want to uh, make sure that they understood that that's, we would leave that decision uh, for them. Um, we also knew that these will not be affecting uh, UIL uh, athletic type things which are scheduled outside of PISD sometimes involve uh, schools other than PISD and have a variety of other tentacles uh, attached to them. Um, and then you can see that um, we'll continue to pu publish a religious observance tool that will now really add kind of the significance we're talking about for these dates and, and uh, I think the feeling was it, it took a, a lot of good work in understanding making a good decision but I think we we are there uh, with our our community with our school leaders I, I think we we all kind of got to one place and said we think this is the best way if we're going to start off with that notion of respecting all and this is, this is a good way to approach that. So th these are our recommendations to the board um, as it relates to uh, dealing with a, a change in this regard. And you'll see the diamonds, as Dr. Solomon noted, on the next agenda item in our calendars. This is, I guess, going to come out a little bit of uh, left field. But if we're being inclusive about our community, I know we didn't put the little diamonds by any of the weekend dates that were holidays, high holy days of note, but I'd suggest that we add one for December 25th because it is a Monday, so it would be appearing in our calendar. I know it's not been our history of attending school on that day, but I think that would be in keeping with the practice that we are now moving forward with, with the other face in our community. The other one would be Easter, but Easter falls on a Sunday and you didn't mark the Saturday Sunday holidays yeah and I was also going to ask if you could add the diamonds on um, 614 and 615 since I know I don't know when summer school is going to be but um, since that is a major um, I'm sorry you said 614 and, and 615 oh, okay. I think is based on the question I'm we not had earlier. going to those. try and say it Okay, so I got slaughter. it. I got it. I will yeah, say that, that was a, that was a good point that was made here that we, we kept looking at the school year and, yeah. and didn't think about the summer school. Yeah. Well, one point. one thing of note though, in response to that particular item, uh, there is no there's nothing in here about excused or unexcused absences because the prior policy of this district was and the continuing policy is that excuses for all holy days are excused yeah right correct and so to the extent that there was a, a student who was marked as unexcused that was an error because yes. that was not the policy of the district yeah and I, I will say just to mention that point I have two let two last things to share before we move on from this if you're ready 
is that again in the report that you received in your board packet one of the exhibits is a list of guidelines and it is guidelines which lead to practice which lead to policy and all those as you know so those guidelines are in there to review if you like um, the last thing I would say is that I would like to offer my thanks to the colleagues in our surrounding districts they were very forthcoming in sharing information with me that included Allen ISD Richardson McKinney and Frisco ISDs um, and in that in that study I was also able to review their calendar drafts as well so again we've talked about how these two combine um, and you'll see that that also informed my decisions there and the research which frankly I appreciate you allowing me to do and I gained a lot of insight myself um, by spending time on other sites and uh, other faith organizations and so for that I, I feel good about the report that's been presented this evening I have one comment regarding those guidelines uh -huh. I think that as Ms. Schlamm mentioned about her son um, in summer school being denied the excused absence I would expect that perhaps we could add a comment to the guideline that expresses how a parent can um, communicate with the district when they do encounter that kind of a situation so that uh -huh. they don't feel um, that they don't know where to turn so because a, a matter of recourse for them exactly to because if, if for some reason there's a disconnect with that teacher they need to find a way to get that circumstance corrected because as David Stolle said that was an incorrect application of our policy maybe in the student handbook you know, right. that's a great go-to place right. for that. Yeah. And I would think it would deal with any issue where a parent thought that policy was being enacted improperly. And so I wouldn't carve out anything specifically for this. Parents just need to know how can they most appropriately make their case heard. Mm -hmm. Okay. But really where, where we started, we started with uh, having kids in an impossible position of in very few holy days uh, not not all of them in, in very few of them that really the majority the overwhelming majority of uh, our uh, community wanted to observe and we put them in that impossible position those holidays are the ones now that were risen to that level and with that we should not have a student in that impossible position anymore in those holidays well, and one last thing, I have to applaud the district for putting in the got in the um, recommendation that you had. I think it was number three. We're going to be um, doing a little more training on the campuses about this, so I applaud that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will say we have not exactly defined what that will look like and feel like, but certainly I think a heightened sense of awareness and bringing that before the staff more frequently. Um, but we have a lot of ideas about that that I think if you will entrust that to us, we will, we will handle it. But I appreciate your comment. Just one last thing. And if you would um, please ask the principal to make sure that they share the information with PTAs, because I do yes. believe on the whole um, they would be very sensitive in trying to make sure that they didn't have some wonderful event on um, any religious holy days. Yes, that, that partly is my job as liaison. and and some of you serve as well as keeping our PTAs informed but that is certainly a relationship at the campus level between that PTA president their other members and the principal so yes we'll be taking care of that as well you know when when this was brought up in the uh, October 18th uh, work session the uh, there was an NBC story that came out and it ended with uh, at this point this is just an idea not anymore uh, so i really want to thank you for all the work it's not an idea anymore we're, we're doing this thank you thank you it was my pleasure so this item is for information only it does not require board action uh, dr bingley do you have enough information from the board to know we do i get the sense what? that the board feels good about what we've recommended and and as Ms. Uh, oliver said it will continue to uh, heighten that awareness and and above all it's it's uh, I, I keep going back to the respecting all and and that's really what we're going so I, I feel like we're gonna go forward in this manner okay thank you so continuing on to the next related topic is another item that's just for our review and discussion not for action tonight action will take place at a future date and I'll we'll turn that over to you Carla uh, thank you President Bender for mentioning that it is just beginning a review process for our calendar drafts we have begun to receive requests or, or tips from our uh, not only our staff but also our community um, 
joining Plano ISD quite some time ago. I will say I was impressed immediately with how important calendar issues are for our district. <laughs> so I take that also with great respect as I did our last item. I, I undertake this as well. I'll, um, if you can work with me on the slides, I, I have the, this is one, we had a, I will tell you we had a number of options that we then try to call down to what is appropriate to bring to our board to consider. Um, the first calendar that's mentioned, it observes 177 days of instruction, and it's most reflective of our current calendar. Um, I know that's not so easy to see, but if you notice, it has a calendar start date of August the 28th, and school would conclude on June 8th following the Memorial Day holiday, which I know is a real key in the, in the general considerations right now regarding calendar, but that's the one that is most similar to the calendar that we are currently observing. The second draft that was a part of the board study and also posted for public um, recognizes 178 days of instruction and the start date would be August 21st and would conclude on May 31st after Memorial Day. So we would come back after there and then conclude that week. And then the third draft as it was originally presented um, also recognizes 177 days. I'm sorry. Yep, I'll keep that up. Can you tell I don't do that one very often? So that's the one I just talked about. <laughs> um, that this the second draft I put up there had a start date of August the 21st, which if you remember the other was the most reflective of this year of August 28th. The second one that's now for your review up there. Please disregard the the numbers up at the top. That's my coding system. Um, that has an, a beginning date of August 21st and an ending date on May 31st following Memorial Day. And then the third draft, see I train well, um, also recognizes 177 days with the beginning as <coughs> August 15th to May 25th as a conclusion. Now I will say since these were posted publicly and we were still working on edits and reviews, we made one slight edit to this that I didn't want to post for the public since most had already seen, but it's really, it's not focused on the issues that we've been discussing at hand, but really just more of an edit. So I'll show you the one that the public saw um, showed a start date of the 15th, and this just all bumps forward one day. We would have a midweek start uh, on August the 16th instead and May 25th, which is the Friday before Memorial Day being the last day of school. So that was just a simple edit there. Did you have something that you want to add, Dr. Bingley? Just, um, uh, you know, this, it, it's called an academic calendar. In some places it's called an instructional calendar. No matter what, they kind of mean the same. And that is we, we try to use uh, our time, including our calendar and our days, to try to put us in the best position uh, to deliver on that instructional mission. Um, so um, we, we really had a lot of conversation around all of these. And uh, from a cabinet perspective, we, we certainly recommend the third, uh, that midweek start calendar is the one we feel that all things considered um, really support our academic program the best. Um, so, uh, you know, for instance, the reason that day moved ahead is we had some good conversation about our schools starting midweek. They, they get into the things that they have to do to uh, kind of start school, all the necessary logistics of that. And then uh, by Monday, because all of that is taken care of in a midweek, short week fashion, we are up and running and in the business of teaching and learning. In, in a focused way. So um, that, that is at least our initial recommendation from a cabinet perspective as to which we feel serves that academic mission the best. I, I will share too, before we open for discussion, and I'm sure you all might have comments to share, is that it's not um, just by choice that we offer these calendars that have an, a non-traditional start date. Our district is a district of innovation as designated through TEA that gave us the um, ability to be a little more flexible on how we might use those days to start earlier and some have chosen to start later even. But for us that translated more to how early do we, would we like to start and how many features would we like to work into our calendar. So if you're wondering why we hadn't done this in the past few years, it's because we now have the opportunity through the state's program. Ms. Oliver, can you uh, go over the process of developing this? How were the uh, options developed? Painstakingly. <laughs> 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 
Um, it, it's not uncommon. I will say that we had a, approximately, I would say, nine or ten versions of the calendar. And again, what we, as I walked through each of the versions that you've seen tonight, typically we always try to present a calendar that, that mirrors what we're currently working under because everyone knows what that looks like and feels like. Um, then given any flexibilities like our DOI uh, designation from the state, we have the opportunity to work in different features. And I will say that of the comments that I've received over the last couple of days, despite one option making perfect sense to one, the exact opposite might be true in the next email that I receive or, or phone call that I receive because really it is a very personal tool within a family and I understand that. So I would say our department joins in that. We talk about all the different comments that have come to our attention. We make note of that. Much like I shared the other packet of emails that we received, we go through and look at all the comments that have been made by calendar. Um, we also talk to our faculty council. We also talk to PTAs letting them know that this process is coming so that they have the opportunity to give us that feedback very specifically. And I will say, and I'm very proud of this, that people are not shy about sharing their comments <laughs> about that as well. Um, so with that being said, when we looked at all the different pieces, we drew what we thought were the most um, popular features of the different calendars and what would give us options. And then we try to call that down to three, this evening being four because of that one edit, and bring it to your attention and then as you go through this review process, we'll be sharing that with others as well with these same groups that I mentioned. Okay, yes. I have a couple of questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Wusso, several years ago when the legislature, you know, took away our ability to start school earlier, um, we lost the um, even nature of our semesters because our community wanted um, the final exam before the winter break. So we had a, a very, you know, a smaller fall semester and a much longer spring semester. That's sort of the circumstance now. If, based on the recommendation that I'm hearing, um, we're going to have more instructional days in the first semester than we used to and fewer in the second semester. We had to spend a lot of time and money rewriting curriculum in order to uh, condense the first semester. Do we need to unpack that a little bit? Uh, do we, are we going to have to make any changes um, to that or is it just something that's going to help teachers feel more at ease um, because they have a little bit more time to cover material? Yes, thank you for the question. I'd, I'd say that we didn't really necessarily rewrite curriculum for the other calendar. What it created were, and so the thing that I would uh, reinforce is even though the days aren't equal, it does virtually reach parity between the semesters if you look at the percentage of days we use for state testing and other testing in the spring. Uh, we've gone and counted that and it's really within a day or two of instructional days in equivalent calendar, so we're, we're very pleased with that. Um, but what I'd say the bigger effect of the uneven semesters wasn't so much coverage. I mean, I think we thought that at first, but as we got into that more, it was more the com compressed grading periods that it, that it created during part of the year. And so it cre created this artificial environment that teachers were cutting off assignments, not at, a, at, at less appropriate times. So that balance isn't really something about semester courses as it is, it affects the entire school year in all courses. So. Um, I'd say over time we've adjusted to say, uh, and especially in year-long courses, if something ran over, so we, we've adjusted the length of units to a degree, but uh, we, have, we have that flexibility to have things really extend over the entire course of the year, so that need to really rewrite curriculum in terms of pacing isn't, okay. isn't a significant issue. Okay, thank you. Um, so one thing that uh, we also changed a couple of years ago was Thanksgiving. We used to just have a couple of days at Thanksgiving and then we took a couple of other days and we had a fall break. But we changed that um, to have a full week at Thanksgiving and I've, I've just personally received favorable feedback about that. Um, is that still, you know, the board's interest to continue with a full week at Thanksgiving or are you 
thinking about anything different and you know unbundling that and doing a partial week then and a partial week in October are you happy with the the way that we've been doing it lately I think well, that we we've probably got I mean we've received a lot of positive feedback on the full week of Thanksgiving right. I personally <laughs> You know, my biggest issue in recent years has been that the the, the desert I called of right. school days between Labor Day and, and Thanksgiving when we had no holidays. We added one last year in the middle of October. Um, and so, you know, the concern there was that kids were going to school for an extended period of time. And so, without any break. So, to the extent we could unpack Thanksgiving and provide for that, I would have been okay doing that now that said it sounds like it looks like we have built in with whatever calendar we have we between Labor Day there's a day off in October and then the week in November I'm okay leaving the week in November because I think a lot of people enjoy that week and travel and take an opportunity to see family and that's you know a lot of value in that I agree with David because I think if we're pushing the start date earlier then um, you know that desert really isn't that much of an impact if we've got that extra holiday that you said. And I think I've heard so much positive feedback about the week at Thanksgiving because they're able to travel. Um, and I haven't, everybody wants the fall break. I remember the fall break because you could go to Disney and not have to wait in line as much because the crowds weren't, you know, you were on a different schedule. But beyond that, I've heard so much more um, praise for the week at Thanksgiving than I have for losing fall break. That's what I've heard from my uh, community members could I also just to make this analysis oh, just a touch easier is there anybody in this board that wants to start on the 28th and end in the middle of June no no don't go that fast <laughs> well I bought something to share because I'm getting emails now about people wanting the traditional calendar meeting the fourth Monday so I'm either a pack rat or an archivist as I'd like to think this is the student directory from Huffman 2002-2003 and it actually has the start date being August is the 12th so our tradition for many years was to start earlier I certainly favor whether we start on Monday Tuesday or Wednesday starting around the 15th of August because when I look at a school calendar the traditional fourth Monday where we have 27 more days in the second semester than the first that's a third more and one of the reasons we advocated to our legislative contingent when we wanted local control of start date was to do the academics right and so I think having the greater balance is much more important. Um, I'm kind of indifferent about the Thanksgiving holiday. I would like for us to consider adding one more day to that fall break time period. And I think about the kids trying to make college visits. Uh, Thanksgiving is not a good week to do that from working at a university for nine years. They're all gone on vacation too. You can't go and attend classes. You really can't get a sense. But if you actually have two days, a Monday and Tuesday, a student could go and sit in classes on a Monday, travel back home to play on, on a Tuesday. And even though that's football season, hopefully they'd get a little slack cut and be willing to not be penalized for missing those days in contrast to having like a Thursday Friday holiday which wouldn't work at all so I certainly hope we will look forward with this August 14th 15th day maybe adding a day there uh, but letting us in before Memorial Day another issue with having that 21st start and you have the Memorial Day some kids start finals then they have that day off or week long weekend off and then you finish finals and so it gives some kids an unfair advantage where they have more time actually to study for their finals depending upon what they're taking. So I'm an old-fashioned Texas. You should text and you should not be in school after Memorial Day. I agree. I, when you were talking about Thanksgiving, I have another comment, but maybe I should wait until we finish with Thanksgiving. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm done with Thanksgiving. I want to okay. back up Tammy. If there's a way to add another day in October, that yeah, would yeah. be preferable for me and I think you know Carl and I talked maybe about possibly a, a, a teacher in service day or something like that where kids are off yeah but you know yeah. there, it's a, a use of that day for the staff right. um, but it would give you know to Tammy's point it would give students an opportunity especially those high school students an opportunity to go take fall visits well I'd like to give I mean I'm looking at the October 9th that's a parent teacher conference right. it's a student holiday but staff doesn't get a break and you know we used to have that Friday before and I, I would like to see if we can have teachers get that Friday off 
you know, everybody have that off. The problem with that is or the other ball kids can't take that okay. off, and so they can't do a visit. So, so Monday, Tuesday, with everyone getting Monday off, teachers working Tuesday yeah. would be beneficial. So I just, however it works, I'd like to see if we can include teachers in the time off category. Now that would back up your start date maybe to 15 because you've got a grading period in <laughs> yeah we're at we're back to the other post again. To six but, that's but okay. i'll let you figure that out but okay i i agree that's why i was asking the question about thanksgiving do we need to take the day from there in order to use it here but if you just back up the start date then but, you've got your day but there there are a few other alternatives and uh, you probably uh, are aware that i posted that on facebook and um Oh, One of thank my you. best. I got all those emails. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the president that has to respond to them. But no, the, the, seriously, uh, th this is a good thing. And, and frankly, I, I have my, my Facebook page has uh, 890 followers. You have uh, what? You have 18,000. And if you if this was posted in the PISD Facebook page, uh, we would probably get 306,000. That's uh, back of the envelope map. But the, the, here's the important thing: some of the comments, actually, majority of the comments where I prefer option three or I prefer option two or I prefer option one so I can tell you that reading those I can definitely tell you that you prefer all three so that doesn't help <laughs> what helps is those comments that actually had all kinds of issues and concerns and you know I have two kids uh, that go to our schools and I was not aware of some of the the things and I wanted to bring up some of those because they they are important and by the way when you share the Facebook post on another page, I don't see those comments, so I, I don't know, and, and neither <laughs> does anybody else. But uh, somebody brought up, actually a few brought up the uh, Forney ISD uh, calendar, and one of the interesting things there, and I never thought about that, is with legislation, legislator, the thing that they do in Austin, uh, <laughs> where they added, I th they now they changed from the number of days to number of minutes of instruction. And what Forney did, I believe, they ad they added 30 minutes to to the day or something like that. And all of a sudden, it's a smaller number of days. So that that can be an option. I, I just wanted to read some of the comments that uh, that I got. Uh, somebody uh, looked at the Lake Travis ISD, so I looked at that too. Uh, there are issues around Christmas break. When we talk about early start, uh, August 15th, I'd be happy. Heck, I'd be happy. Somebody uh, recommended that we actually take out summer break, not have summer break, just teach uh, throughout the entire year. I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, but uh, UIL activities, athletics, band, and things like that, that if we start on uh, August 15th or, or early in August, that would cause some problems to them. Uh, one of the issues that came up, and I, and I don't know how we go around that one, is people plan ahead some some activities. Uh, one parent mentioned a bat mitzvah that was planned, and all of a sudden we're changing this, and it becomes almost impossible. But you know, people plan cruises that you know you have to schedule probably a year and a half in advance, which is way more than we do. I, I don't know that there is an answer for that. Teachers in general, the, the, feed that, the feedback that I saw was that the major issue that they brought up was the unequal uh, semesters. And I think that option three, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, is the one that has 75 days versus, no, uh, the first one has 75 days versus 102 days, which uh, teachers said that did not make sense. Uh, one other thing is the alignment with other districts. Yes, we are a district of innovation. We can move around, but what do you do when the friends of your kids are not on vacation yet? Um, there were issues with the long time, and, and you talked about that with um, uh, having maybe something in October. Long time until the first break, if, especially if we start early, there's a long time of, until we get to the first break. Uh, some commented on uh, leaving school before Memorial Day and not after. There is obviously the issue of uh, if we want to start as traditionally we have, uh, then winter break right now is the break uh, between the two semesters. What happens if we have testing period right after that because we're going to push a semester? Uh, summer jobs, summer camps. Um, travel I, I mentioned uh, AP test uh, that's one of my daughter's teachers posted and, and talked about AP test in the first weeks of my of May and he said if we are going to have an earlier start that would be great uh, for them to prepare for AP test um, so I, I think one of the things to, to keep in mind is that 
all, all those considerations. Can we think of something like maybe Forney, like maybe adding 30 minutes to the day and then we have a smaller number of days we can play with it a little more or something like that? I was going to say that I think that in the past we've had this discussion and I feel like we have a tri, um, you know, three-way bus system in Plano ISD because um, we don't receive the subsidies that they do in Houston and um, Dallas and so we're probably not at liberty to switch up 30 minutes to <laughs> without making some kids get home at six o'clock in the evening. I'm not the expert on that but that would be consideration for transportation. One of the questions I had this week, and I, um, I've had a conversation through email with um, Dr. Busso, and he was very prompt in responding, and I know that he spoke with Ms. Cuttis in our Fine Arts Department. I do have a concern about the UIL activities, and I would like to further explore what options we have, because um, for our students to be competitive in their um, athletics and you know, band, choir, orchestra practice, a lot of the students come to school few weeks before school start date and UIL mandates that you really can't do that practice before August 1st August is that 4th. okay that's right so I, I just I know that we've had this conversation and you're going to do further exploration but I would like to hear back from the administration if there's any kind of accommodations because we have become a district of innovation and, and are amending our calendar day does that give us an opportunity you're shaking your head no <laughs> Got my answer. <laughs> but is that something that we can work with the legislators on? Because that might be, what do you call that? An, an, an consequence? Unintended consequence. Unintended Yeah, I merge words. <clears throat> unintended consequence. I mean, I would think that is a high probability we could get them to ch to do something for. I, I, can, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, yes, this, um, this rule by UAL, and I'll, I'll speak maybe to the fine arts piece and Dr. Cooper can speak to the athletics. Yeah. I, I assume it's parallel, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, but it limits, once we're into school, then you get into a different practice cycle. So it's those days before school. And um, Ms. Cuttis, as you mentioned, uh, met with the band directors at the senior eyes. They've done some research and there's kind of mixed opinions on the impact. Obviously some adjustment would have to be made, but the best guess it might it might equate to about 15 hours up to 15 hours of difference in practice time if with this early start and having to adhere to the August 1st now I'm reading something we did contact the UIL and heard back I'm reading something a little different into the language it's it's their comment was at this time we're not in entertaining any thought of changing uh, based on districts of innovation changing calendars. But to me, that's, I read that as not a closed door. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, at this time, <laughs> um, it appears that this rule came into place when the state standardized the calendar. Prior to the standardized calendar, we did start in late the last week in July. Uh, so it just seems reasonable to be, I, I, again, no guarantees there. And it, we might run up against it this year, but it seems like there would be potential room for negotiation with UAL to, okay. to have some change. Jim, do they limit the number of hours per day the kids can practice in band, for example, when they start August 1st? Is there a limitation on the number of hours? Um, no. no. Not, before the first day. not before school once, starts. Once once it starts, it's eight hours a week. But before before it's there's no limitation on per day. The, the reason I ask is because the, the band and drill team kids, and I'm, I'm most familiar with those two areas, they would always start the 1st of August, but it'd be kind of this funky two hours one morning, two hours one evening, really messed up carpool type of things. And so uh, actually having more intensity, but fewer of those days to worry about carpool would have been a really good thing. <laughs> Dr. Cooper, do you have any UIL commentary to add? No, well, a couple of things, and, and we did check on the, the back to the District of Innovation, and that, that was their response, so I was uh, appreciate Dr. Russo covering that. Uh, we did have some conversation with Ms. Cuttis and Jerry McCondrat, some of the group out of fine arts. Also had input from Susan Hayes, which works with our cheer and drill, and then obviously um, the athletic standpoint with, with the athletic department, uh, Coach Branson, also the, 
um, assistant athletic directors. I was able to talk to the three senior high athletic uh, campus athletic directors and was not able, I reached out, but was not able to hear from as of today our uh, volleyball, three senior high volleyball coaches who are in, would be impacted by potential. I guess with, with all that said, there are uh, different things that the UIL does say very specifically. So before, uh, before school begins, here are some specific guidelines that come down from the state. And then once school begins, the thing that is consistent across, whether it's fine arts or athletics, is that what you hear referred to as the eight hour rule outside the instructional day, which many, many of uh, you are familiar with. The thing that we, in summary, that we talked about, and I know some of this might be, um, could be debated a little bit, but there is a difference between uh, what might be an inconvenience and maybe adjusting uh, routines that we're used to versus what is could be a almost a, a valid competitive disadvantage. Those are those are two different things. Um, and, and after all of our conversations, there wasn't really anything that said, you know. If we start on August the 21st or August the 16th or something, we are going to get our head handed to us or we're not going to get in the playoffs or we're not going to advance in UAL competition. I mean, that's just, that's a, that would be a very difficult thing to, to say at this, you know, to, to pinpoint. It goes back to, well, we didn't get an extra couple hours of practice here and there. So um, it's workable. They were all very... The comments that I received were, you know, it's like, hey, you know what, we can, we, we will make adjustments, we will deal with this, but there wasn't anything that's like, okay, this is, this is going to be a problem. Yeah, you know, Tammy's Huffman Hawks guidebook is from 2002, you know, having this, the date, start date be, what was it, August 12th? 12. 12. But it wasn't, gosh, how it's like 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's been, we've started the middle of August. It really is late, it's probably the last five years, maybe even within then. But so it's not like it hasn't been done and this district hasn't done it before. And so I'm, you know, I appreciate your comments that I find it hard to believe that missing a couple practices in the first part of August is going to be the difference between a state championship and coming up yeah. short. But the other thing Dr. that was, um, well, Dr. Musso pointed out that UIL had different. Um, rulings after the state mandated the start date so do remember that there were changes Yeah, no I recognize that but okay. you're talking about starting on the 15th and you could even if they kept the rules the same way they are your start date is August 1 is that right you can't start before August 1 correct so you well, got two weeks which to, activity yeah right. the athletics and fine arts have different correct different rules so um, you, you know you would you would still have two weeks of unlimited practice in a fine art setting to prepare for the first week of school before you're starting to be limited. Yeah, and what, what was interesting to hear from uh, a few of the, the individuals that was kind of surprising, but really getting into the school day and that structure and that consistency, that, that is a big, that is a benefit because you're not competing with, you know, kids going here, there, and everywhere, whether it's just finishing their free time or jobs or X, Y, and Z. And I thought that was pretty interesting that some of them pointed out. It was like, you know what, even if you start earlier, that's okay. We'll work around the practice. But when we get into a consistent schedule, when we practice either before school and in the first period or seventh period class and then continue on after school, there's a lot of value in, in having that, that consistent uh, schedule that they have. Um, just to, I think all the points have been addressed except the one about minutes. So I think that um, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think we looked at that. We did. We did. So can you, can you talk about that, pros and cons? Sure, I'll, I'll make a run at that and then certainly among my colleagues if they want to speak up, that's fine. Um, other districts may have had a little more room in adjusting their minutes of instruction. But for us, we're already meeting. I'm sorry, Susan, you're shaking your head. Would you like yeah. to, to hop in? It depends elementary and secondary. Right, two, go ahead. right. We, it's the two different we things. We would only have to adjust. We would have to adjust our elementary and middle school. And I think we looked at it was about 15 minutes a day. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it it's doable. It, it would mean um, I, I would we'd have to work out the the transportation whether we would. I'm not sure we could add any to the end because of our staggered starts um, and bus routes, but it may be possible to either split the difference or add to the beginning. We just weren't in a position where we needed to right. do that this year. So I would ask the question, if that were possible, what's the value in that? You know, what, like if it would shave off, uh, you know, extra weeks, I mean, the parents that I've heard that work, indicate that's not helpful to them. A lot of them say, well, that gives me childcare problems. I think the value, I, th I, I think the question came up, somebody had uh, mentioned the Forney calendar yeah. and how were they able to do that. I mean, we could do that also if we, if we didn't want to adjust our time and wanted to add additional waiver days, we could reach the same mm -hmm. um, or a similar calendar, I think. Yeah, um, or if you didn't want to apply for waivers, you wouldn't have to go through that process. You would just have to meet the minutes mm -hmm. by extending the school day. Did we not also have an issue pertaining to our early childhood we, campuses as well? Yes, yeah, and we still do, still do, and we're still, we're, oh, we're very okay. short on their minutes, and yeah. we're, we're still figuring yeah. that out, yes. We're, we're hoping for some legislative relief on that right. issue, but I, I would say that Dr. Solomon, the list you gave, um, comprehensive list, uh, short of cruises, uh, we probably talked about every one of the things that you mentioned in, in, in our cabinet. We've, we've seen districts, they're trying to use minutes so they can close schools and go four days a week to save money. Uh, others, the, the primary ones we've seen using minutes have been in an attempt to buy large chunks of time where they would have students not be there and so teachers would have large planning time I think is what we've seen haven't we isn't that something where people have tried to use minutes to accomplish that um, and then others to potentially shorten the calendar but um, again we've every one of these things was a lens through what what makes the best sense for us to provide the, the best academic program that we can um, and, and that's ultimately what, what we kind of came down to. I'll, I'll add one last thing and then really, I, I don't know what else I might say. Um, the calendar drafts this year are a little bit different in that they go from July to July. If you notice, um, one, uh, regarding a comment made tonight, there may be a couple of other uh, acknowledgements that we need to add, but also when a, when a teacher or another person within our organization looks at this calendar beyond the use of a parent, having those days reflected on there and it kind of smushed our, our graphic format a little bit, but it was told to me that they would be, it would be helpful to them to see as July rolls into August and as we roll into June and July at the end of the school year. So that's just something different. If you wondered why, that's why. So your recommendation is the third calendar that starts on as presented the 16th the modified version and ends the 25th the modified version of may um, which is before memorial day correct and um, the feedback that we've given is that let's see if there's an opportunity on that calendar to please add a day for teachers in the month of october you know maybe we can we'll trust you to look at that you know mecha right. how, how you can deliver on that um, the only other thing that I was thinking about as it relates to minutes, and it might not be a pro time to do it this year, but as we're looking at our commitment to professional learning, mm -hmm. and you know, especially at elementary, we have a hard time finding time for teachers because you know they're generalists and they don't work like secondary does. I get that. If if you know, this is a strategic way to get at that and deal with the other obstacles that you have, that would be interesting to see what that would look like. And if now's not the time to do that, I understand, but that would just be my feedback on a going forward basis. That's a tool that we have. If it works for us, that would be great to explore. Um, I would like to ask one clarifying question of Ms. Richards. Um, you mentioned in that October how how your suggestion might be to consider that. 
tell me again, just so I can be certain, if we added something that meant that teachers could be off as well, mm -hmm. where was your suggestion for that to fall? Everyone would be off on Monday the 1st, and the students would be off also on Tuesday the 10th. Yeah, the 9th. Yeah, she meant the ninth. 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's late. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry, Monday the 9th, everyone <laughs> off. Tuesday the 10th, just the kids. She so they can do their college Aubrey. visits. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Okay. And right now, that's the only recommended change for us to review. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, so c going forward, your your plan of action will bring forward a revised calendar and maybe anything else that might come up in between right. now and then. And, and we'll continue to take yeah. input as yeah. well. At the February 7th meeting, is that your plan? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this would be up for... I'm saying yes. Is that Dr. Bingley, is that what yes. you agree with too? <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. One other thing, for a while there we did two, two years at a time. We're just gonna do one year Yes. <laughs> right now. And that's my recommendation right yeah. now. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. I think at some point it would be good to move back to the two-year format because as people are planning long-term things, whether it's cruises, holidays, in order to have visibility a year in advance, I think that's very helpful. So once, I know we have not been able to do that because of the legislative right. uncertainty. And also testing schedules and such, but we're gonna we're gonna get on that. If we have the chance to do it next time, that would be lovely. Still some balls in the air. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I know, Carly, we've had you working hard oh, the last truly. while. I feel like we so, made a lot of, he a lot um, of headway. Thank you to all who've contributed to that conversation. Okay. We have another report, and this this one is going to be presented by Dr. Jim Wusso, our Assistant Superintendent for Academic Services, and he is going to introduce the report on the Plano ISD Dual Credit Classes Concurrent Enrollment Program. Dr. Wusso. Thank you, President Bender. Actually, um, truth <coughs> is I'm going to call our experts to the podium to deliver this. Um, Dr. Lisa Thibodeau, Executive Director of Secondary Academics, and Janet Hancock, our Director of Counseling and Guidance. Thank you. Um, good evening, President Bender and Board of Trustees, Dr. Bingley and Cabinet. I have to tell you that I, um, at the corner of my eye, saw Jana walking down the aisle, and I thought she was abandoning me <laughs> at the last minute. So if I look greatly relieved, that's, <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, I'm happy to share with you tonight a report and an update on our dual credit program. I'm going to go through just some foundational information with you and some background and then for the actual implementation of the program I'm going to turn that over to um, Jana because she's actually our resident expert in, in the in what this looks like on campuses and the student experience. So, um, Just to define the language that we use around this, we um, we actually uh, use some terms interchangeably here. We try to kind of stay clean when we can with it, but dual credit is the overarching term for any time when a student is enrolled in a college course and they're earning credit um, in two places, here in high school and then also for, in, in, uh, for college credit. Uh, a, a dual enrollment program could, and we do have dual enrollment also, and that's more specifically when a student is enrolled in college, but that course may not be giving them high school credit also. So what we're talking about tonight is specifically our dual credit program. We're not mentioning the work around the uh, Health Services or Health Sciences Academy or the um, Plano Academy High School, just specifically our, our dual credit, which is, is, to confuse it a little more, which is also concur a concurrent enrollment program here in Plano because the, that all happens in one place. That all happens on our high school campuses. So that's, we have a concurrent enrollment dual credit program. So just so we're kind of share, sharing the same language. So we were asked a little bit to talk about our philosophy around this and really we're adopting this idea from um, the higher ed coordinating board. Um, we've had this program for over, over 20 years. We we're trying to trace that back. 
Um, and really we do see it as a stepping stone for students to get into a college pathway. A bridge, if you will, to um, get them started on a, on a course that might lead to um, early credits or um, admission to, to college. So, um, the, and, and a lot of this is also um, research from the Higher Ed Coordinating Board, but, but these are just some of the advantages that we see to students. Overall, the research shows that the likelihood is greater that they will complete high school um, if they start through a dual credit or any <coughs> program in a high school that gives them college credit, and also that they will just persist in college um, in general. Then also there's this, and we hear this a lot from our families, a decreased overall cost of tuition. Obviously when they start school and they've already, they already have a handful of credit hours. Um, also they graduate um, from the more expensive program in a shorter number of years. That's, that's a benefit to them. And then um, this is a benefit to students, but also to the economy is this early, earlier workforce entry. So. Um, they're entering the workforce, and they're earning wages at a younger age because they started the process of, of earning that at a younger age. And then um, the advantages to, to district, and I just always feel like saying, obviously the greatest advantage to the district for us is that there are advantages to students. You know, So, so beyond that, um, we have goals in our district that we wanna meet, including our, our commitment to equity goal. And, this program, like AP and IB, helps us meet some of those goals. Um, there is a positive contribution to our staffing ratio, which is the result of these programs existing on our, on our campuses. When the Collin College um, teachers come to our campus, that's a benefit to us. The advantages to college, they would also tell us that um, this, when students earn their degrees more quickly, that frees up some facility spaces for them, that frees up some faculty space for them, so, and then it, they can then have higher enrollment without expanding their facility spaces or hiring addi additional staff. And then the higher ed board tells us that there's just a positive effect on the students' attitudes towards college enrollment in general. There's some related research on there about um, students even uh, staying in programs, doing post back work and some other things because at a younger age they had positive attitudes towards, towards college. So, um, and, and also not fair to not talk about some of the drawbacks that we face. So, and FERPA is one, and really this is a communication piece, but um, so FERPA, the privacy laws, federal, federal privacy laws, they apply the moment that a student enters a higher ed enrollment so for the most part the age for that is 18 but if we have 16 or 17 year olds who are enrolling in a higher ed program FERPA immediately immediately applies so that's a little shocking sometimes when all of a sudden parents can't get access to the same information that they that they would normally have um, there's some course content and faculty control that um, we negotiate around a little bit um, the college has direct um, access to decisions around course content. They hire the faculty that comes onto our campuses. And then, um, of course, there's some TSI score requirements, which I'm going to call out Jana, also on the resident expert on TSI. I might say the state expert on TSI. <laughs> so um, that's my nice way of saying if you have questions about that, mm -hmm. I will be deferring to my friend mm -hmm. over here. Um, so right now, just some quick factual information. These are the courses that we mm -hmm. offer here in Plano and um, on the left, those are our uh, state courses. On the right, those are the, the college courses. Uh, and then um, US History and English for year-long courses. The other two, government and econ, are semester-long courses. Students take those through con uh, dual enrollment through Collin College for us. Here's what our enrollments look like. Just, it's a short history. We, we could dig um, deeper into a longer history if you're interested in that, but we just kind of looked, looked to see if there, we saw any trend in enrollment. Um, certainly not a decrease, a um, little bit of an increase over a short, short period of time in there. Then if we wanted to look at this by campus, um, the first row shows us that 
overall, so out of 100% of the students who are participating in dual enrollment, um, this is where that breakdown, this is how that, that breaks down. And then if we wanted to look um, of the total school population of each high school or senior high school, what the enrollment is. Um, and I don't want this to deceive at all, this number. So the denominator in this number is the total number of students enrolled at that school and the, the numerator, that's the, the number of students, or the number of uh, dual credit courses that are being taken. So a single student can represent, some could represent four on there, um, up to four. So, and I wanna explain this seven to 10%, because we were interested in looking at this number too and hadn't looked at it in a while. Um, the whole of Plano East contains the ninth, and includes the ninth and 10th graders and also the IB program. So we pulled out those, we pulled out the IB program. Our IB students do not take um, dual en enrollment, um, dual credit. They, they don't have a lot of motivation to. Their program dic dictates a lot of their courses. They're receiving credits differently. Um, their courses are weighted differently. So we pulled them out. We pulled out the ninth and 10th graders. Then that gave us more of an accurate um, denominator, I would say, at Plano East. So then that puts that number at about 10% of the- Can I ask you a, a sure. quick question on the, on the yes. previous slide? Um, on the, the hard numbers, are those the numbers of students that are taking one or more courses, or is that the number of student slots that are enrolled in those? So could that, that, that is, so there are 742 different kids. Okay. Yes, okay. Those, are, those are actual students, okay. yes. Yeah. Uh, so then the um, uh, we were and we were asked in the guiding questions to, to look a little bit at the number of students um, reporting as economically disadvantaged enrolled in the program so the first row there shows you in the program that percentage of students who have enrolled in the program report out as economically disadvantaged and that the source of that number is free and reduced lunch for that and then just to give you a point of context against the overall school so the second row has um, no relationship to the dual credit program, just overall for the, the school as a whole, for just your comparison purpose. Okay, so I'm turning this over to Jana to talk about the, um, the fun part, the, the yeah. student part. I'll try to be as linear as possible. I struggle with that sometimes. Uh, <laughs> The, the enrollment process can be a little bit tricky, particularly the first time that a student enrolls in dual credit. So the counselors are really dedicated to helping these students get through all of the process. A lot of the processes that they have to go through are mandated to Colin College. So I can tell you that, that Colin works hand in hand with us to try to simplify the process for students as much as possible. Uh, one thing that we've developed in uh, Plano is a student contract, which sounds kind of harsh, but really it, what it's designed to do is outlay or lay out all of the steps for students, outline the deadlines that they have to meet, which as we know on, on those college campuses, the deadlines are very hard. So it's really kind of a step-by-step -step guide, and it also helps the counselor know who has expressed interest. Because basically we keep a copy so that we can follow up with those students and see where they are in the process and we're working with Colin to get reports throughout the registration process so that we can follow up with students that aren't up to speed, haven't applied or whatever it is that they need to do. Then we go to the Colin College side of things. Our, our part is actually easy. They sign the contract and they give it back to us. The permission form is required by law and they have to complete one of these each semester. So what we've done to try to help students through this particular uh, part of the registration process is that uh, we, we get these permission forms from Colin, so that it's their form, which they have actually worked to simplify in the last year. It's helped quite a bit. Uh, then, then what we do is we collect them from the students and then give them to Colin College for them. So the students aren't asked to drive over to Colin with their permission form and go through all those lines. And those of you who've walked through registration lines with your students or remember doing that in the past, it's not a really fun thing to do. So we facilitate that for them and get all the paperwork over there. We also send transcripts on their behalf to Colin that's part of the required uh, registration process. 
Um, beyond that, they have to apply to Collin College. Collin has also created their own application in the last year, which is simpler and easier to navigate. They used to go through the Texas application, the Apply Texas form. So that's helped uh, a little bit. Basically, the student has to uh, apply for the college and they are accepted because we know that Collin has an open enrollment. Then they, they turn in that permission form. We get all of that information over to the college. At that point, the student's ready to get online and actually register for the course. Some other things that we do to, try to help these students is that Collin College is very generous with their time and coming over to campuses. They'll come over two, three times a year is what I, or in the spring is what I think most of our schools have scheduled so that a student can sit down in a computer lab with a representative from Collin College and work on their application if that's what they need or actually complete the registration process if that's what they need. So beyond that, students that are not qualified for free and reduced lunch have to make payment by a certain deadline. Uh, the deadline is, is in May this year, at the end of May, and we've already put out information to parents through e-news on the campuses that that's coming up so that they can plan for that. Now, one other element to the, to the process is that, uh, thankfully, students that are qualified for free and reduced lunch do not pay tuition at Collin College. So what we do at the district level is we create a listing of all of the students that are registered for dual credit course, qualify for free and reduced lunch, and we generate these individual letters and then take them over to Colin. So that free and reduced lunch student can stop the process after they register. Then we take care of it for them from that point. So this Colin College enrollment checklist is really just their listing of what students have to get through and our contract provides them with a little bit more information and the TSI is another I'll mention that very very briefly because uh, it is kind of complicated students have to take the Texas success initiative exam in order to start at any public school in Texas so regardless of whether they go to Stephen F Austin or Texas Tech they're gonna have to take this exam it's a placement exam only has no impact on their admission or any kind of scholarship offers that they might receive from the college. They can also be exempt from the TSI, but that is, is a constantly moving target, which is not Collins' issue, it comes from the state. Right now, they are determining what a proper exemption score might be based on the PSAT. Based on the revised PSAT, which was revised in October 2015. So. The wheels turn slowly sometimes, but um, that's a little bit tricky for our students right now because they, they don't have a valid PSAT score to use because that um, exemption score hasn't been determined. They can also be exempt through an ACT or an SAT or an EOC English 2 or Algebra 1 score. And I won't read you all of the scores, but if you'd like for me to send that to you, I'd be more than happy to. I, I have to look, honestly. I, I don't retain all of that information in my head. <laughs> Okay, um, the other thing that we are able to do for students if they have to take the TSI is there is a waiver that's provided for free and reduced lunch students. The cost is $29, but we can help those students that need to take it and can't necessarily afford that with this waiver that's provided by Collin College. We're also looking into offering the TSI on some of our campuses so that students wouldn't have to travel over to the, to the campus or to the Collin campus. Um, they also have really extended hours over there. So that helps students in terms of they can go take the TSI on a Saturday or on a weeknight. But uh, it'd, be, it'd be especially convenient for them if we could do it for them closer to home. So we're working on that as well. All right, hope I've covered that in all of its um, detail. <laughs> Okay, textbooks is, is another issue that I think has been mentioned uh, in this group before. And again, if you have students in college, you know that sometimes those textbooks can run into the hundreds of dollars. Colin is, is very committed and, and really we depend on them to take care of this, this uh, or keep these costs in check for our students. But they have uh, reached or built a partnership with Barnes and Noble. You know, a lot of the big colleges have those big Barnes and Noble bookstores so that's a huge thing for them in order to create some volume and keep those costs down for textbooks um, 
and they try to be cognizant about it. The professors have a lot of control over what they choose to require as a textbook or as additional reading, but they are aware of it and really work to keep those costs down for all their students, not just our dual credit students. In Plano, we're also looking at some grant possibilities that we may be able to provide for students. They do have a grant program at Collin College, but it's not highly funded. So it would be difficult for us to say, we're gonna make sure that all of our free and reduced lunch students get this Collin grant because it's just, there's just not quite that much um, funding available for them. Okay. The other thing that we've done in preparation for this presentation is look to some other districts and find out some of the things that they're doing. And that really there's a wide variety of opportunities out there, options that people take advantage of. We have districts that uh, allow students to take uh, concurrent or dual credit courses on the college campus. A very few of the ones that we reached out to pay for that transportation and provide that transportation. Many of them allow students to go over there, maybe give them an extra period in the day to travel over there, but they take the course on the college campus. Uh, online courses is becoming increasingly prevalent in a lot of colleges. And Lisa will tell you more about a program that we have uh, being piloted this semester in Plano or this year. So a lot of them are offering online courses for students, gives them some flexibility. We also have some campus or some districts that are using their district staff and teachers to teach these courses on their campuses, which would mean that the teacher would have to be certified through the college as well. And then we, we have reached out to some schools or one school in particular that offers a dual credit AP course that's, that's co-seated basically. And I'll let Lisa tell you about that in just a minute. Okay. And these are the, some of the things that we're looking at. This is your, I'm gonna turn You're this right, over to I'm you for this. Enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> so entertaining. I'll share it with you. <laughs> okay. I think Lisa was gonna talk about the blended model. Yeah, so we, um, so, and Janet mentioned the PISD instructors and using our own instructors for those courses. And I'll just say kind of um, honestly, there's, there's some mixed feelings around that. It's definitely a possibility. There are some great benefits to doing that, some of that control over um, who's teaching your courses and who's in front of your students. There's a textbook benefit to that, of course, because um, not, not only does it give us control over the textbooks, but it could cut down on changing books every semester or you know the buyback process. That could be a checkout process instead of a sales um, thing. So um, we've gone so far in that area as to provide each campus with a list of the teachers they currently have on campus who would be qualified to do that. So meeting the Colin requirements, the master's degree in the 18 hours, um, and, and that's kind of where we are in the discussion. We're getting feedback from our senior highs on um, kind of pros and cons on that for them. And um, the blended model was initiated at Plano West in the uh, spring of 2016, last spring. It, was, it worked out beautifully. Um, it had been, we weren't the first ones to pilot that for Collin College that had um, worked in Allen ISD, I think it was. And so um, now the other schools are interested in picking up that same model. That allows a single professor to have access to more students um, for like a, for a fr the Friday meeting date. So I'm here when you need me, kind of almost like an office hours on campus. And um, then also that uh, it, there's a lot of facility reasons that that's fabulous also. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday classes instead of working in three day week classes, that sort of thing. Extracurriculars. So extracurriculars on Friday, cutting down on absences to the course if you're out for UAL or we're looking at additional courses also. And this is really coming up in the next couple of weeks. We have some conversations with Colin College about the course that you all approved last time, the multivariable calculus um, and what that might look like as a dual dual credit course. Excuse then, me, what was yes. the blended model again? Um, the, the blended model started as a pilot at Plano West and the students who would normally have attended maybe a Monday, Wednesday, Friday course are attending only Monday, Wednesday and, and or to a Tuesday, Thursday course. And then Friday opens up time that they can meet with their professor on campus if they need to. And that um, the blended portion of that model is developed by Colin. It's an online 
blended. So they have access to assignments or modules online, and if they need extra assistance with them, then someone's there. And then um, Jana talked to you about the revised registration process that we're looking at just kind of streamlining and then the financial support, which I know um, Mark Allen was involved in that conversation as well too. So that's what we have for you. So did you talk with North, uh, Northside ISD in San Antonio because they offer dual credit AP in the same classrooms? My nephews went through that program. We had a very short conversation with them face to face. So we see some of these districts that are similar to ours a few times a year and we had a super short conversation with them, but then an extended conversation with the folks at SciFair who've been doing that. It sounds like a little bit longer and um, looked, we looked into that program and, and heard the way that they and, and their relationship with their college, their local college, and um, the the primary benefit of that is, uh, as a lot of the folks in the district see it, is that there's no more competition between the AP and the dual credit. And so students are seating, sitting in that class and they're getting the dual credit and they're getting their AP credit. It does involve an important relationship with the college because you, you really do have to ensure that the course content is not just the college's vision of that course content, but that it also satisfies the AP requirements and the AP so that students could sit for that test if they wanted to and, and it's appropriate for them to be getting AP credit. So. I, I appreciate you giving this report tonight. I, um, it's been a long time since we've talked yeah. about it and um, having had the first-hand experience with it as a parent now, I felt like uh, from that vantage point it was worth talking about and um, thinking about uh, where we go from here. Um, there are some objectives that just I personally would like to throw out that um, in your future planning, um, I mean I don't know exactly, I'd like to know more about where this is headed and what timeline and um, you know, I know we're doing investigation, but exactly where are we going with the investigation and is there a wrap up time and so forth. But some of the things that are important to, to me and you know, I hope you all weigh in too is um, more content options, you know, more abil more opportunities to earn dual credit, however that whatever that looks like. Um, uh, I'd like ex the lower cost, you know, situation uh, opportunity. Um, you know, Jana, you talked about you know working with Collin College and the enrollment and the waiver and all that stuff. I've been through that with a student. It's messy, and it's a turnoff for a child. And um, the whole book situation. It's, it's, it's uh, clunky, what has to happen. I know why it is, but I don't like it. I think we can do better. And I, I wish it were a seamless process, such that the student didn't have to go through the clunkiness of it all, and have to go get a waiver, a piece of paper, or whatever, and then not know how I'm gonna get books. And if, if that were seamless, you know, there are a lot of co a lot of schools around Austin that seem to have partnerships with Austin Community College, such that students don't have to pay. I mean, I don't know what the financial arrangement is. I'm sure there is one, but it would be interesting to know what that looks like. Um, I understand the challenges between AP and dual. I get that. Um, I just think we can we can do better and offer it to more students. And I know with the high school study academy stuff, there will be some component of this in that. But even outside of that, just for a regular comprehensive high school programming, I'd like to see. Um, I think I don't think you disagree with me at all. <laughs> I just feel like it's time to talk about it and resurrect this topic and do something that, you know, that we all think is better and less costly and more accessible. I, I agree tremendously. And it's actually my hope that every 
graduate of Plano can come out with 30 college credits a full freshman year in the major they plan to pursue. And I use as an example, when I was at SMU, parents would come to me and say, oh, my kid's taking college algebra. That's great, but that doesn't help a freshman year engineering student. You need to have taken calculus. And so I hope we would be so bold to look at our offerings and look at a number of majors. I mean, kids typically, when you ask them on the PSAT what they want to major in, they all want to be doctors. So you've got medical, you've got engineering, you've got business, education, maybe liberal arts. That probably covers 80% of the majors that kids at least think they want to pursue. So if we could craft offerings where those basic areas of concentration would be covered, that would be huge. Because I know we like to think of ourselves as a wealthy district, but it's amazing the kids that I know that graduated from high school that are waiting tables now because they can't afford college. And if we can get them that first year head start, I think they can more easily see a pathway. So I hope we can expand the course offerings to add science, to add more math, uh, to add the second semester of history. Whatever we can do to help that student start off ahead, it's going to be tremendous. I echo your comments, I agree, and I think that the course offerings expansion would be wonderful. I have a question, if I may. I really applaud the efforts that you have made with the student contract and the, you know, the you're trying to reduce the clunkiness, it's evident, mm -hmm. and I understand that's a process. But um, when we do have students that um, don't sign up for free and reduced lunch, but are qualified for free and reduced lunch, is there a way for us, if they're searching for dual credit options, is there a way for us to encourage them to sign up for that? Are we looking at that in this uh, student contract and permission mm -hmm. form, et cetera? We actually have those conversations frequently because we have students that could receive a waiver to take an SAT or an ACT, and, and there are a whole lot of things that they could qualify for. And I want them to eat lunch, but um, there are times that I've had conversations with students and say, I'm not, I'm not monitoring your lunch time but if you would fill this form out, it would open up these possibilities for you. So it, it seems like it's more of a struggle the older that they get and they, they, they tie it more into lunch and it, it really means more than that. So those are conversations that we have frequently with them. We have a, a little bit of access into additional information beyond the students just applying for that. And I know that our assessment department has done some work with identifying siblings. So when the students are older and they don't want to take the paperwork home or don't want to fill it out, then we, we might have access to that through siblings and the younger grades who are filling out those documents. And I know that we can expand the list of, of our understanding of kids who may need that support that way. So. In terms of looking forward and your future plans, can you talk a little bit more about the effort behind the planning yeah. and how that might manifest itself here at the board table. Sure. So um, we really had started some of some of those conversations in the summer, really around, and that was through um, what I would say is a reinvigorated reinvigorated relationship with Collin College. So some of those, and maybe even last spring, some of those conversations started with them. So what are the options? And I, I would also say that um, the Health Sciences Academy launched some of those discussions too because there are opportunities there. So around the use of instructors, I, I would say that, that we really have some momentum in that discussion and we're happy to report that in that um, not that, that was going on already. And I like the momentum behind it and I feel like we're getting, um, it, those are important conversations and they're tricky conversations because of the effects of staffing on the campuses, but, but I would say that that's rigorous work there. Um, and then the same with the blended model. So, so that's really changing some of the perceptions. And of course, it's like anything around culture. So we want to change some beliefs, beliefs and perceptions. And then um, all of a sudden, you start to see things more clearly. OK, well, there's all these opportunities. Around the additional courses and things like um, the, the dual credit AP, I'll say those are very new conversations and really launched. A lot of this is launched by conversations that we've had with other districts and 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 I like the idea of the timeline and it wrote a note and I think that we'll go back and kind of look at that and say what would be a reasonable timeline for us to explore this um, and making sure that that timeline uh, corresponds nicely with the way that new courses are rolled out and 
how soon campuses need that kind of information in order to make course plans and four-year plans with students and that sort of thing. So. Given where we are in this semester, yeah, it, you know, in students having to make choices, it seems that we wouldn't be in a place such that new options would be on That's the right. table for fall right. or the next school year. Right. So I wouldn't want to lose another no. year of time. Yeah. So however that falls would be great yeah. to fit as soon as possible. Yeah. It's, it's really yeah. the best possible time right now to have this discussion in order, because we know we're too late for 17-18, mm -hmm. but in order for us to have the um, maximum amount of time before really we have to get this, roll this out for okay. the following school year. I think I'd add too from the crystal ball standpoint of the timeline the other element of this is is Collin College is having yes. some of these same kind of conversations as recently as two weeks ago Dr. Wusso and I and David hit I mean they're they're talking about some embedded counselors into our schools to to really help they 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 are trying to even streamline more where they can uh, we're having deep conversations about how we thoughtfully add to what are, will be our continuum of offerings in, in dual credit, as well as other more exciting potential opportunities further down the road. So, you know, there, there's a lot of good conversation that's, that's coming forward. And I think maybe for the, for the first time, both entities really kind of have a desire to get to the same place. We just, there's some work that has to be done to get there. I want to uh, offer a uh, somewhat contrarian position, <laughs> big surprise, uh, but, but really only on one item. Uh, first of all, I, I, I love this program and my daughter, my older daughter is going through uh, I think the second semester of uh, dual credit classes with Collin College. Uh, I would love to have more classes, more opportunities in, in different areas. I would love to reduce the cost of it and, uh, and the uh, cost of books. Uh, in terms of the clunkiness, I, I think um, one of the things I did with my daughter is I, I had her do everything. You know, you had to apply and by the time they got to a credit card number, I gave mine. But she had to do everything. She had to, uh, th this last week, she had to buy a book and she looked at me, I need that book. And I looked at her and I said, what are we going to do about it? And she had to go to Collin College and stand there for an hour and a half. She was surprised to have to stand in a, an hour and a half uh, in line. But you know what? Last time I stood for an hour and a half for her. I, I, so I'm, I'm not that worried. It, it's not that, that I think that it's great, but I'm not that worried about the clunkiness that, that you referred to. Because to some extent, what was going through my head is that we are preparing them for life because life works that way you have to remember to do this and you have to go to that website and you have to pay for this and you can't forget that i'm that doesn't bother me it's uh some of the clunkiness it works for your daughter and it works for mine mine yeah. got hers on amazon by the way her book your what my daughter got her book on amazon you can do that too instead of walking over there yeah. but um for the students who are in after school activities it doesn't work that nicely when to go, they don't have an hour and a half, and they only have one day to go get the book before the next class. If they're in an after-school sport or something like that, there there are other circumstances that um, I just think that as our district is changing in its profile, I don't want to forget about the students that are uh, who were really trying to help get a leg up on lowering tuition costs and so forth. It's not easy for them. And when they don't have the money to pay for the book and they don't have the way to figure out how to buy the book and all of that, I, I, I'm concerned about that. The, for, I'm, for that. I'm with you on, on prices and all. And uh, yes, I, I do agree when, when she came home and said, uh, I need to have this book and by when? By Thursday. Mm -hmm. That, that, that's a bit problematic, but not, not the process itself. So I'm, I'm really talking about the process itself. The, fa the fact that you have to go figure out how to get the book, and I don't know how you found yours on Amazon, she couldn't find hers, but uh, <laughs> when you have to go and get the book and, and you stand in line and, and you have to do the, the registration, I, I didn't have a problem with that process. Yes, the, the timeline was a little too short and uh, the, there, there's room for improvement, but I, I don't want to make it too smooth, if, if you know what I mean. Okay. All right, any other questions? 
Thank you very much. Thank well, you. as you're doing the, the new website, make sure this process is clearly outlined. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the forms can be downloadable, so they don't have to go to the counselor's office to pick them up. Yes. Well, okay, <laughs> last item for information only is our budget report from our CFO, Steve Fortenberry. You've all talked to us about 2017-18 budget assumptions and preliminary estimates. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I know the hour is getting late, but uh, with all due respect, I want to spend about two minutes telling you my thoughts on Betty Hahn. Oh. You mentioned her at the outset. Uh, she was very proud that she was the first secretary this district had had, but uh, I worked with her. In fact, Jim Wusso, Linda Madden, Susan danced with her, several of us. That, they knew her better than I did, but I worked with her for four or five years. Uh, I don't know what a secretary would be, but I thought of Betty as a chief of staff. She was that important to this district. Uh, she was here from 1957 to 1996. She saw the district grow from probably about a thousand students. To, I didn't check the numbers, but in 96, probably over 40,000 students. Uh, of our 72 or three sites, she's probably uh, I guess she probably saw 50 or 60 of those built. Uh, she was right there with Dr. Hendrick for pretty much every land purchase for the site planning, for the architect selection. Uh, she worked with the city on, on development. When you look at a map of the district, it's laid out so nicely in grids with, is, is the city developed and you've got an elementary school pretty much in every, the center of every major quadrant uh, or or section, I guess, square mile of the district where the major roads uh, cross. When she first got here, I think she was temporarily housed at, at Williams as they were sharing some space with the, the school. She spent probably most of her career at the Cox Building. She moved here. She uh, she was here all of Dr. Hendrick's career, I believe all of Dr. Surratt's career. Uh, those were the most formative years of this school district, being what it is. We take a lot of the planning and, and systematic uh, growth and, and, uh, and development of the district for granted now looking back, but to me probably the two people most responsible for that were Dr. Hendrick, who most of you knew, and Betty Hahn, who probably a lot less of us knew, but uh, I admired her greatly. Uh, as Susan Dantzler told me, I feared her every now and then too. Uh, <laughs> When you talk to Betty, you better know what you were talking about or she would let you know. Uh, I remember she asked once for some figures on how much one of our new schools had cost. And I said, well, let me go back and pull those off the computer. And she said, when I did that, if you asked me, I could open this book and show you immediately what the costs were. Uh, I had the great privilege of seeing her, uh, I guess it was a Friday before Christmas. Uh, as she was declining, it was kind of funny because I called her and uh, and said, I guess it was a Thursday, and I said, can I come out and visit? Do you feel well enough? And she said, well, I have an appointment today, so uh, either after you get off I said, after you get off work, I said, well, I'm not working today. It's Thursday before Christmas, and she said, what's become of plain old <laughs> uh, Then when I got out there the next day, I asked her. Uh, uh, how did your appointment go? I assumed it was a medical appointment, and she laughed and she said, actually, I went and got my hair fixed. <laughs> so, uh, she was a great lady, and for anybody who didn't know her, I, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes, so maybe you'd know her a little bit better. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's talk about the exciting thing that's the budget. I thank everyone for staying here, because I know this is what you were waiting for, <laughs> the budget report. Uh, Try to be pretty brief. There's the first part of this is the reasons to panic, and the last part of the presentation is the reasons not to panic. So uh, let's kind of roll through our, our key assumptions. Uh, based on our demographers report, uh, we're expecting a decline of about 316 students, as we've said in meetings before. Uh, that's not people moving out. That's that's the fact that. We're graduating classes with over 4,000 students and our kindergarten classes are coming in with 3,500 or less. So we just have a natural decline primarily as the uh, 
is the community continues to, to age a little bit. Uh, in our assumptions, we're assuming right now property value growth of 6%. Last year was over 9%. Uh, we do continue to have high growth rates in the uh, residential property values. And then we also see some commercial development uh, with new property coming on at Legacy West and also still in the, uh, the State Farm area, that, that corridor. So should have some good property value growth, uh, which helps us a little bit for a year, but really hurts us the next year in terms of recapture. We will get in April a, a, a better preliminary estimate from the appraisal district. And as we work through the process this spring, uh, these numbers will be refined somewhat. We're assuming that we maintain the current MO tax rate of $1.17. And for purposes of, of this presentation, we're assuming that there are no changes in the school funding formula, uh, that every, everything remains as it is today. So with that, if we look at our revenue forecast first, uh, we established a, a baseline for this year, which we look at our budget, uh, which you actually voted on the amendments to that tonight on the consent agenda. Uh, but we pulled out some of the things that were non-recurring, such as the inflow that we've had from uh, property insurance money for hell damage. So we really establish a baseline by pulling out the non-recurring items. So uh, we compare that to our preliminary look at 2017-18. At On the local revenue line, we see an increase of about $32 million. That's uh, all because of the increase in the, the property tax values. The state revenue, we see a decline of about $13.4 million. That has nothing to do with recapture, which you'll, you'll see that number later on this sheet. Uh, and I'll talk about this a little later at, towards the end of the presentation, but the state revenue that we do get, uh, two of the primary parts of that are the per capita money. Uh, that comes from the permanent school fund revenues. The state uses that to help fund the formula. For a non-chapter 41 district or a district that's not paying recapture, it really makes no difference uh, if the state's sending them X amount of dollars, if the per capita amount, which is a per student amount, goes up, the state just nets that and, and they don't really see the benefit of that. Since we're off formula, so to speak, and are, are paying recapture, uh, the Constitution says that those funds are available for every student, and so we do get that amount uh, on top of the formula. The state has also uses that money to fund the instructional materials allotment. And so they have, the last biennium, they, they, uh, they front loaded the amount that, that you could draw out of the instructional materials allotment. And so in the first year of the biennium, we have a, a huge decrease in the per capita amount. The following year, it goes up. Uh, so the 16-17 baseline had $390 a student. Uh, but then the 1718 would go back down to about 180. So we have talked to the Texas School Coalition to see if there could be some provision in the law to smooth that out to where we don't have the peaks and valleys. Uh, so we lost, uh, well, that'll decline about $11 million next year, but the following year it should go back up. Also, the, uh, the templates at this point do not reflect any increase in the Austin yield, which drives six pennies out of our $1.17. Uh, we do pick up some state aid because we're equalized up to the Austin uh, yield, which is the Austin ISD's taxable value per student. Uh, since our values are growing, if that ceiling doesn't go up, well, then we get less state money. Uh, so those two things are why we we lose about $13.5 million in state revenue. The other items we've held constant till you get down to the recapture line. Uh, so for next year, we're looking at total revenues of about $614 million, but then the recapture payment to the state will take away $148 million of that, leaving us with a net of about $466 million, uh, which is a $25 million decrease from this year, even though the tax rate's the same, and we're projecting a 6% increase in the property values. A couple of, uh, start to say highlights, it's probably more lowlights about the recapture. 
Uh, that's an increase of almost $44 million over this year. That would then become 27% of our maintenance and operations tax levy. So for every dollar that a citizen taxpayer pays for our maintenance and operations tax, 27 cents of that goes to Austin and only 73 cents would stay here. That will make it bigger than our entire debt service payments, which by the way, the citizens have voted on, but they didn't vote on recapture. Uh, and it amounts to now about a 32 cent tax rate. So uh, that's something that we would hope would be remedied, but uh, to a large extent, it's that's probably not gonna happen. Just go around. But, uh, I think it is telling that it's more than our entire debt service payment. The largest item in our bond package was our performing arts center, which I believe was 60 to 65 million. What we pay in recapture, we could buy two of those every year to put that in perspective. So it's a huge amount that the state takes away and I, I hope they do something to remedy that. The next page shows the expenditures, uh, again, taking some non-recurring figures out. We have a baseline budget of about 580 million. The recapture payment, as discussed, goes up about 43 million. Uh, in this January presentation, we generally put in a placeholder for our compensation increase, and we plug that in at 6 million, which would be about a 2% uh, pay raise. That's certainly nothing that's promised, uh, either as a ceiling or a floor. It's simply a placeholder as we kind of see where we stand with the budget. Uh, we will have some savings uh, in our staffing formulas primarily as our enrollment declines. And so we, we plugged in about a $1 million decrease uh, in expenditures based on that. And then again, strictly as a placeholder, we. Uh, we've inserted three million dollars for other increases uh, that would primarily be programmatic things that, that we discussed this spring a lot of that would probably revolve around early childhood as we continue to expand that and then also looking at uh, at other high need schools and things that we could do to uh, to improve the quality of education there uh, again if you net out the recapture we end up with net expenditures of 483 million so putting the revenues and expenditures together, this is where at first you might panic because revenues would be about $17 million short of expenditures, uh, which would draw our fund balance down to about 176 million. Some, I call these potential mitigating factors of simpler language would be why we shouldn't panic, uh, cause for hope. Uh, three, three areas, and I'll give you a little more detail on each one of them, but historically we don't spend everything that's budgeted, uh, number one. Number two, our fund balance levels are, are substantial and we're in very good shape uh, balance sheet wise. And then thirdly, uh, and hopefully this is a, a positive, there is a legislative session and so there's two or three things there that seem fairly minor that could happen that could help us out. Uh, uh, to a pretty substantial uh, level. So first of all, with the historical budget variances, I won't bore you with each of the last five years. If you look at the bottom line, uh, particularly in the expenditure variance column, we've been pretty consistent uh, and averaged a little over 2% of our budget that, that doesn't get spent. You might ask, how does that happen? Uh, we budget for full employment, full staffing, but as we have vacancies during the year for different periods of time, uh, we save some money there because our substitute rate's not as high as our, our contract rate. Uh, we also generally take a snapshot in the spring of our, uh, particularly with our teachers, since that's the largest part of the budget, uh, but as they retire and generally, are, as some retire and they get replaced with those with less experience, there's a bit of a, a variance there. So those, those are a couple of the major factors. So uh, maintaining that history with a 2% variance would, would generate about a 10 to $12 million under expenditure, which uh, going back to that previous page, that 
kind of eats into that 17 million pretty substantially. Our fund balance history, uh, percentage-wise, we we've, we've been above 25 percent for at least the last 10 years. Uh, looking down at 2017, even if we spent everything that was budgeted this year, we'd still end up with about a $193 million budget, uh, I'm sorry, fund balance. That uh, will no doubt be higher than that. Uh, and then the following year, again, if we spent everything that was budgeted in worst case with revenue, uh, would still be at about $175 million, which would leave us at a 26% level. So. Uh, we're in good shape there. There's no no reason to panic, and uh, uh, again, giving a lot of credit to to those that were here in the past. Uh, building up that fund balance is something that's that certainly benefits the district. As far as the legislative session, the three items there that <clears throat> there might be the greatest possibility of uh, of happening, which could help us. Uh, Hopefully, the, the House Appropriations Bill has included about a billion and a half dollars to enhance the formula. Uh, most of the talk is centered around increasing the basic allotment because that benefits all school districts. Each $100 increase in the basic allotment, which by the way right now is at $5,140. So a $100 increase is a little less than 2%. Uh, which doesn't even track inflation, but if the state could find a way to do that, that has a positive impact for us of six and a half million dollars per year. Uh, I'd already mentioned the per capita allotment that's weighted heavily in the second year of the biennium. If they would smooth that out and just average it, uh, we'd pick up about a little over five million dollars in next year's budget. Then the third one right now, I kind of hold out the greatest hope for, and that's increasing the Austin yield on those six golden pennies. That's uh, kind of hard to explain. The first dollar of our dollar seventeen is not the golden pennies. The last eleven pennies are not the golden pennies. It's those six pennies from a dollar to dollar six. Uh, those are right now tied to the Austin yield. The state has to take action in the appropriations bill to increase that amount. But both the Senate and the House appropriations bill have included a, a provision to increase that to what the true estimate of Austin's tax base would be. Uh, so it would increase it from $77.53 per water to $99.85, an increase of $22 per student and we would pick up 8.9 million dollars uh, if that provision stays intact and nothing else changes it's very promising that it's in both the Senate and House version of the appropriations bill uh, and it's what they've always done since 2006 when the golden pennies were, were put into the formula every biennium they adjust it and so we're very hopeful they'll do that. So I just want to point out, Steve, we have 2.7 up there. We're at 8.9 is the, right. is the figure that we've been. Right. When yeah. this was when this was repaired, we were. Uh, I had projected if they just increased it the same percentage that they right. did the last biennium, I think right. that was four percent. We'd pick up 2.7 million, but since that time, I guess it was earlier this week or late last week, those appropriation bills came out. So that's even more promising. So. Uh, this is just the beginning of the process. We'll work through it in the spring as we always have. Uh, you know, we're not in, in wonderful shape. We're, we're still waiting on some things to happen, but because of the strength of our balance sheet, uh, the way that we budget conservatively, it's, it's certainly no need to panic at this point. Steve, I, I don't remember which budget it is, if it's the House or the Senate budget, but one of them, uh, takes 1.5 billion dollars of our uh, money that has been collected for the purpose of public education and does not it, it supplants the state budget so if they kept all of the money collected in the name of public education in public education there'd be 1.5 billion dollars to distribute somehow along the lines of what you've descri described perhaps the hundred dollar increase in basic allotment that's correct it's the uh the Senate version removes that million and, or billion and a half uh, and uses it for 
I guess other purposes. Other obligations. Uh, the House version returns that to where the, the state funding dollar-wise remains the same. So they they keep their commitment level where it is, at least dollar-wise, if not percentage-wise. The House version for public schools is a, a much better version, or somewhat better version. <coughs> So they're not saying there's going to be a budget deficit, or they're not cutting. I mean, everything I've read that says we're going to be like four or five billion deficit. So I'm I'm prepared for the cutting. So yeah. the uh, the comptroller's revenue estimate came in and, and showed it had less money to spend this biennium than last biennium. Uh, my understanding is the Senate appropriations bill fell within Glenn Hager's estimates. Uh, the House version was above it, so there might have to be some other other cutting measures. Yeah, the Senate didn't even spend in their budget what yeah. they could have spent. They went way under. That's correct. And the t the commissioner didn't even ask for a, a, as much as he could have asked for. Right. So, okay. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Steve. At most of our regular meetings, we have policies on the agenda for the board's consideration. These policies have undergone prior review by the district's attorney and by each board member. I invite uh, Carla Oliver to introduce these policies. Ms. Oliver. Thank you. We have one to consider this evening under second reading, CFC local regarding accounting and audits. Uh, revisions have been made to the policy CFC local to bring district practice into alignment with policy in regard to the reports provided to the board's audit committee. And again, as always, this update's been reviewed and approved by the district's legal counsel. Do I have a motion to adopt item A on second reading? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion passes unanimously. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Oliver, do we have any comment cards for non-agenda? Thank you. No, we do not. Okay. With no further business, the meeting of the Board of Trustees is adjourned. <laughs>